Welcome everyone to the first quantum information session of ICMP. Today is, will be, I mean, devoted to contributed talks. And we have, a, as you have seen, probably a pretty packed schedule uh, with 10 talks in two hours and a half. So I really ask all the speakers today to, be, I mean, really stick to their time, which is 12 minutes. Uh, probably there is no time for questions, or maybe at most one after each talk. So if you have questions, please use the I mean, tools of the platform to uh, I mean, ask the questions, either in the question, question and answer uh, toolbox so that the speakers can later after the session uh, has, has passed go there, see which were the question and answer them, or contact directly the speakers by the uh, tool of uh, meeting people or just by meeting the speakers on site if you are both on site. Um, okay, and with this, I, I introduce the first speaker today, which is online. Uh, I think it's uh, Adam Sabiki, and the talk is uh, titled Epsilon Nets, Unitary Designs and Random uh, Quantum Circuits. So the stage is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And let me share my presentation. Okay. Okay, is it visible? I hope so. So the title of this talk is Epsilon Nets, uh, Unitarity Designs uh, and Random Quantum Circuits. And this is a joint work with uh, Michał Oszmaniec and uh, Michał Horodecki. So Michał Oszmaniec is from the same institution as me. So the Center for Theoretical Physics, Polish Academy of Sciences and Michał Horodecki is from the University of Gdańsk. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> so let me start with the motiva motivation. So <clears throat> the claim which I have on this slide is that the unitary group is uh, unphysical, uh, which means uh, for me that it's impossible to implement all the elements of the unitary group because there is a continuum of them. So there are two notions of uh, approximating unitary group and uh, one of them uh, is epsilon nets, and the other one uh, is unitarity designs. And the talk, uh, uh, this talk will be about the connection between uh, those, uh, uh, those two notions. So let me start with the epsilon nets. So uh, an epsilon net is a subset of the unitary channels or simply unitary matrices that approximates every unitary up to some accuracy epsilon. So for every element in the unitary group UD, there is some element in the set S such that distance between U and V is less or equal to the epsilon. Of course, we need some definition of distance. So in this talk, I will use diamond norm, but uh, one can use any other norm because basically norms in the finite dimensional spaces are equivalent. Uh, okay, and so how can we generate uh, epsilon nets? Uh, so uh, the usual uh, thing one can do is to consider uh, universal gate sets. And then, uh, so let's say that G is a universal gate set, and then we have some target unitary V0, which we want to approximate to the accuracy epsilon with the shortest uh, possible sequence of gates from our set G. Uh, so then it turns out that it can be done uh, with approximately uh, log one over epsilon to some power. This power depends uh, uh, on the dimension of our group. Uh, so this capital C here, it depends on D. So this is the length of the circuit which is needed to obtain, uh, 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 to obtain a um, epsilon net. So in the solovay kitaev theorem, which I just stated, there are two uh, important ingredients, uh, namely, uh, actually one important ingredient, uh, that we need symmetric gate sets. So whenever some U uh, belongs to the set G, then its inverse also is needed. Uh, so what are the uh, unitary T designs? So the second notion which I'm uh, supposed to speak, the second notion of approximation for the unitary group. So some ensemble of uh, 
unitary channels with some weights, new uh, alpha forms a unitarity design. If uh, the difference between, uh, if the norm of the difference of those two operators, t nu t and t nu t is equal to zero. So these operators are so called moment operators and they give some averages over either our ensemble, which we uh, want to be a t design, and the second uh, uh, ensemble to compare with is the whole unitary group with the natural measure, which is on every compact group, so the Haar measure. So if the norm of the difference of those two operators is zero, we say that uh, uh, the, uh, the unitary channels we consider are, uh, they, they form a unitarity design. Uh, okay, and then there is also a notion of uh, delta approximate T designs or T, T expanders, and this uh, uh, applies to the situation where the norm of the difference is just smaller than delta. This delta is always between zero and one. Uh, okay, so there is also another way to, for, to define T designs. So we say uh, in terms of other operators, so uh, uh, we say that uh, ensemble of uh, quantum channels will be uh, a unitary T design if the difference, uh, if the norm of the difference of those two operators is equal to zero. So what are those operators? So they act on functions uh, which uh, are defined on the on our Lie group. And we take, uh, to have a T design, we take only functions which are balanced uh, polynomials on, uh, uh, on our group of the degree at most T. So if calculating those av these averages uh, given by, uh, uh, um, with respect to the measure nu alpha and with respect to the measure mu, so the ha me measure, in my uh, terminology, mu is always the ha measure. If those uh, things agree, we say that we have a unitarity design. And if the norm of the difference is not equal exactly to zero, but to some delta, once again, this delta is between zero and one, we say that this is a approximate, delta approximate T design. Uh, so what is perhaps important here to see is that this operator T mu, when we calculate it with respect to the Haar measure, is just a projection operator. So it takes function on a group and it projects it onto uh, a constant factor of this function. Uh, okay. So, uh, of course, the natural question might be, uh, perhaps I will skip all those uh, uh, applications, but how to implement uh, uh, the design. So there is a standard way to do it through random quantum circuits. And uh, to have a T design, we just need to build some random quantum circuit, which has the uh, depth, uh, which is polynomial in the number of qubits and in the degree of the design. Okay, so now uh, the main uh, uh, element of this talk. So uh, results. So the first result connects epsilon nets to uh, approximate T designs. So if I have an epsilon net, then out of this net, I can always construct uh, some uh, two epsilon T approximate T design. So this is the first result. And the second result is that approximate T designs actually form epsilon nets for sufficiently large T. So uh, just to specify what is this sufficiently large T. So if I, if I have a approximate delta approximate T design, which is given by some support U alpha and some weights, then if this uh, uh, design, if this T is of the order uh, dimension to the power of five over two divided by epsilon, and if this delta is of the order epsilon to the D square, then I'm sure that uh, the support of this measure nu forms an epsilon uh, net. Okay, uh, so these are like the two main results uh, uh, I wanted to state. And uh, actually the result number two uh, has a much nicer proof. Uh, actually the idea of the proof is much nicer. So I will just very briefly speak about the idea of the proof. So <clears throat> it goes to some uh, 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 harmonic analysis on the unitary group. So let ft uh, be uh, some approximation of the Dirac delta, 
which is centered at the, at the identity of the group by polynomials of degree t. I don't specify now uh, what is the degree uh, t exactly. So <clears throat> the only thing which we require from this ft is that it integrates uh, to one when we integrate it over the whole unit group with respect to the ha measure. So the action of the operator t mu on ft is equal to one. So now we can consider some integral. So I call it it of epsilon. So we choose a ball, which is centered at some element of the unitary group, V0. This is an arbitrary element I'm choosing. And this ball has radius epsilon. And I integrate the action of the operator T nu on this FT over this ball. So if I assume that uh, my, uh, my uh, measure nu has a support, which is a T design, then of course T nu on FT is exactly the same as T mu on FT. And we know by previous slide that T mu on FT should be one. So making this integration gives us the volume of the ball, which is centered at V0. Sorry, it should be V0 here. And now, uh, look, if I require from the unitaries, from the support of this measure nu, not to form an epsilon net, then this integral can be arbitrarily small. So here is some instructive picture which the, shows this situation. So we have our approximation of delta. If I act on it with the averaging operator t nu t, I will get uh, uh, those approximations, of course, scaled properly, attached to, to uh, every point of the support of my measure. And then there is this element v0 and the ball of the radius epsilon. So if I choose epsilon, uh, small, then I can somehow avoid uh, those deltas and the integral can be arbitrarily small, uh, which is of course contradiction because this integral must be always equal to the volume of the, of the ball. Uh, so speaking in different words, I can always uh, somehow increase t because when I increase t, I have more polynomials to use and I can make sharper approximation of delta and I can avoid the ball. So there should be some relation between this epsilon and t. So here we, uh, uh, from this uh, simple reasoning, we see uh, that such a relation exists. And then there is, uh, I don't know, a lot of harmonic analysis to show how actually this relation looks like, because we need to uh, uh, find as nice as possible approximation uh, of this uh, Dirac delta using uh, some polynomials up to some degree. And this is uh, something we did. And if we do it, then we get this uh, uh, relation that T scales like uh, dimension uh, divided, uh, divided by epsilon. Uh, OK. So this, uh, this, this was the idea behind the, the proof of the result number two. So now maybe a little bit of applications, because this theorem, which I just discussed, uh, can be also used to formulate uh, uh, inverse free Solovay-Kitaya theorem. Uh, so first of all, notice that when we calculate the norm of the difference, so if we take the convolution of a measure mu L times, then uh, it's, uh, this delta is taken to the power L. And there is also uh, some strong result uh, which I will use, and this is from the paper of Varju. About, this paper is not a quantum information paper, it's a paper about random walks and compact groups, but the result uh, can be translated to the language of uh, T-designs. So basically it says that the norm of the difference of those two operators we are considering uh, is bounded uh, from above by uh, the following uh, uh, formula. Uh, which depends only uh, on t uh, here in the denominator as a log, uh, log t square. And uh, the other things are connected to some constant t0, so there's some minimal uh, degree of the design which makes this theorem to work. So it, it's true for every t which is greater or equal to t0. Okay, so look, we know that if we have a t design, with t of this uh, form and with delta of this form, it is immediately an epsilon net. So I can take some measure which has uh, in a support a universal set 
and it will be, uh, uh, and I, I require for it to be uh, delta prime approximate uh, T expander. So this T is of this form. However, delta, uh, delta prime doesn't uh, have to be of this order. But I can now take the convolution of this measure mu. So uh, I will consider words of the length L constructed from the support of this measure. And then, of course, this norm can be my, I can make this norm smaller. And uh, I can choose L such that this uh, delta prime to the power L will be of the order epsilon to the, square, uh, to the d square. And the required L is exactly given by this formula. So uh, now you see that uh, this L depends on delta prime. Uh, so I want to get rid of this dependence and this can be done using this uh, uh, result of Varju. So from this result, we know that one minus delta prime T star is actually bounded by C divided by log T star. So once again, so here, here we have this log T star and T star is roughly one over epsilon. So if I plug here instead of T star, uh, this, uh, this value here, then I get that the unitaries of the length L, which uh, uh, is of the order log one over epsilon to the power three, they form, uh, uh, they form epsilon, uh, epsilon net. And what is important here is that this uh, factor so, of three- I'm sorry, uh, you, you should finish. Yes, this is actually uh, something I, I wanted to finish with. So this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this power here does not depend on the dimension of the group, which is very nice. So I was planning to show something more, <laughs> sorry. So let me summarize. So we have a quantitative relationship between approximate T designs and epsilon nets. From this, we can construct inverse free solo by Kitai theorem, which does not require those uh, inverses uh, to, uh, for it to be true. And what is perhaps uh, uh, an interesting open problem is that the reasoning which I showed you uh, is actually not an algorithm. It's just a theorem which st states that uh, if there are no inverses in the universal set, you can still approximate any element uh, with roughly log over uh, log one over epsilon to the power three uh, uh, long sequences, but uh, it doesn't tell you how this sequence should be built. So I think it's an interesting problem uh, to solve, to, 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 to find an algorithm which uh, enables implementation of, uh, of this uh, inverse free solo Kitai theorem. So thank you very much and sorry if I used too much time. Th thank you, Adam. Uh, okay, I think exactly we should... Clap, I don't know if you can hear us, but okay. Yes, I'm hearing, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, I, okay, I think we should move to the next talk, which is also online. Uh, and is, uh, I think it's given by Felix Lidisky, Lidisky sorry. And uh, the title is Asymptotics of Port Based Teleportation. So, Felix, please. Yes, uh, thank you, David, for introducing me. And, and thanks to the organizers of the session, uh, Nalanjan and David for putting together a great program. So I will be talking about a recent paper, Asymptotic Performance of Port-Based Teleportation, which is joint work with uh, these uh, great colleagues here. Uh, let me get right into it. So I first want to talk a little bit about uh, general teleportation protocols. And so the idea of teleportation is that we have two quantum parties, Alice and Bob, who are somehow separated, and they want to use some resources that they share in order to send quantum information from Alice to Bob. And it turns out that uh, uh, teleportation works when uh, the, the two parties share entanglement and they can use classical communication. And then using these resources together, they can establish a quantum channel between them. Here, entanglement is, is, is a genuinely quantum non-local correlation. For example, uh, if you have two qubits, then you can consider this maximally entangled state between them. And uh, in a little more detail, so we have this idea that entanglement plus classical communication uh, uh, implements a quantum channel. And so the way that uh, most teleportation protocols work is, is that Alice first uh, applies some measurement to the, the system that she wants to send to Bob and her share of the entangled state. And this is a measurement that gives her a certain outcome. And this measurement uh, basically will uh, 
correlate the, the system to be teleported with the entanglement. Uh, as a second step, Alice then sends this measurement outcome to Bob using this classical channel. And then as the final step in the teleportation protocol, Bob applies some kind of correction operation to his share of the entangled state, which is now controlled uh, by this message that Alice sends. Uh, and the idea is that, that this will kind of teleport this uh, target state into Bob's uh, system here. And so this was uh, initially conceived by, by Charlie Bennett et al. in the 90s, uh, and this is now usually referred to as standard teleportation, where um, this measurement here that Alice performs is a bell measurement. And uh, Bob's correction operation consists of, uh, of one of the poly operators that he applies to, to his share of the entangled state. And then in the analysis of, of, of the Bennett et al. paper, uh, it's, it's, it, it comes out that this is actually a, a perfect teleportation protocol so Alice and Bob can really perfectly teleport this, this target state from Alice to Bob. And another advantage is that it's a very simple protocol. It's very, like, uh, very appealing, the, the simplicity of it. However, there is one disadvantage that prevents the standard teleportation protocol from being applied in, in certain situations. Uh, and this is this correction operation, which here uh, in the standard protocol consists of Bob applying some poly operation to his state. And this is a disadvantage because in certain applications, and, and one of the most well-known ones is instantaneous non-local computation, uh, there you want the correction operation to actually commute with an arbitrary unitary. So you want this uh, correction operation to be as simple as possible. And so this is now where port-based teleportation enters. So this is an idea by Ishizaka and Hiroshima, where uh, the goal is to, to come up with a teleportation protocol that simplifies the correction operation as much as possible at the expense of introducing more resources in the, in the protocol. So instead of uh, one entangled state, Alice and Bob now share a couple of entangled states. So this will usually, uh, this will always be the, the capital N in my slides, the number of these uh, entangled states. And the idea is now that uh, Bob's correction operation only consists in choosing one of these ports on his side, which should hold the teleported state. So the protocol works in the same way again. Alice applies some measurements to, to basically entangle her system that she wants to teleport with these uh, port systems on her side. So this is now one big joint measurement of all of these systems on Alice's side. She then again sends the classical outcome of that measurement to Bob. And this classical outcome now labels one of the ports that Bob should uh, expect to hold the teleported state. And it's then easy to see that this, this correction operation, which is basically now tracing out all but one of these ports, now commutes with any unitary that they apply to their systems. And so this is the, the property called unitary covariance, which then gives rise to these applications that I mentioned before. So this is one of the symmetries of purpose teleportation. Another symmetry is that basically it, the, the protocol shouldn't depend on which port exactly comes out to be the one holding the teleported system. And so mathematically, this means that you have a permutation symmetry on these uh, ports on Bob's side. And it turns out that you can actually also symmetrize the measurement to have this symmetry. So the unitary covariance and the permutation symmetry are the two symmetries in the game. However, there's a caveat now because this unitary covariance property means that finite dimensional corpus teleportation protocols cannot be faithful. This is a no-go result by Nielsen and Chuang. And as a result, um, the, this porpoise teleportation, even though it, it gains this nice property of unitary covariance, it loses the, the faithfulness of the original protocol. And so now we, when we talk about porpoise teleportation, we actually talk about a noisy quantum channel that uh, sends the system from Alice to Bob. And uh, we now want to characterize the noise of this, of this protocol. And, and a good way to do this is the entanglement fidelity, uh, which is a well-known uh, measure of distance of quantum channels where you uh, send one half of a maximal entangled state through this channel, and then you check uh, how close am I to, to the initial entangled state. Uh, and the measure that you, you choose is the fidelity here. So this is why it's called the entanglement fidelity. And the entanglement fidelity is one if and only if the channel is noiseless. So the closer the, the entanglement fidelity is to one, the better the teleportation protocol. And so in order to characterize this entanglement fidelity for port based teleportation, we want to use these symmetries because they actually simplify this analysis quite a bit. And so again, we have, we have these two uh, group actions. We have the unitary group acting on the port systems. In fact, um, it acts via uh, 
the dual representation on the input system and uh, the, the normal representation on the uh, output ports. So we have this unitary action. And then we also have this permutation group action, which just permutes these uh, uh, systems on Bob's side. And the nice thing is that we know that these two uh, group actions play nicely with each other. So they, they commute. And, and what's more is that they span each other's commutum, which then means that the representation space uh, decomposes into the irreps of these two groups. And this is, this is known as Chauval duality. And, uh, What's more is that these um, irreps are each other's multiplication space. So the unitary group only acts on this uh, V module, which is the while module, that's an irrep of the unitary group. And the symmetry, uh, the permutation group, the symmetric group only acts on this W uh, module, which is um, uh, the representation space. Uh, it's an irrep for this uh, symmetric group. And then there's a way to also incorporate this, this dual representation. And, and this can be achieved using the so-called Pierre rule, which is a classical uh, result from representation theory. Okay, and so then uh, Mikhail Sudzinski and, and colleagues uh, were the first ones to use this representation theoretic language to uh, describe the entanglement fidelity of, of port based teleportation when uh, the resource state, this entangled shared state, consists of just copies of maximum entangled states. And so we have this, this uh, nice formula of the entanglement fidelity in terms of this representation theoretic data so the, the quantities that appear here, the d mu and the m d mu are the dimensions of the two irreps, d mu for the symmetric group and m d mu for the unitary group. And the way to read this formula is that you uh, fix a Young diagram alpha, which indexes these uh, irreps. Uh, you fix a Young diagram alpha on n minus one boxes, and then you add a box uh, in the rows where you can do that, such that the, the row lengths are still uh, non-increasing. And then for this new uh, Young diagram mu, you evaluate this function of the of the irreplicable dimensions. And now natural question. So this is a very nice close formula for the entanglement fidelity, but uh, the problem is that it's hard to tell what happens when you increase the number of ports. Okay. And so uh, what we want to know is what happens when we fix the dimension and we we, we take this limit. And we know from prior work by by Beg and Koenig that uh, the protocol does become perfect in the limit. So as you take the number of ports to infinity, the entanglement fidelity approaches one. But uh, it was unclear what the exact uh, asymptotics of this, of this limit are. And so this is, this is the goal of our work, that we determine these asymptotics for a fixed local dimension d and uh, this limit n to infinity. And I want to go quickly through uh, the, the main proof steps uh, that, we, that we took in order to determine these asymptotics. And the first one is that we rewrite this entanglement fidelity expression as an expectation value over uh, uh, the Chauval distribution, which is a distribution on Young diagrams. Uh, so this is the, this is the Chauval distribution for Young diagrams on n minus one boxes. And you can understand this as just uh, the, the numerator here is basically the size of this sector labeled by the alpha, the Young diagram. And then you normalize by the total dimensions so that you get a probability distribution. So we've rewritten the entanglement fidelity as an expectation value, but we still have this, this kind of like uh, cumbersome sum over all of the valid Young diagrams that I get from adding a box where I can. And so here, uh, if you take an example of a degenerate Young diagram where two rows have the same length, then you will see that uh, you're allowed to add a box in the first of these degenerate rows, but not in the second one, okay? Because this is not a valid Young diagram anymore. And so this, this complicates the evalu evaluation of this expectation value. And so uh, what, what we proved in, and what simplifies the analysis greatly is that you can actually uh, neglect the contribution of these degenerate Young diagrams in this expectation value in the limit, okay? So uh, we're allowed in the limit to pass from this uh, sum over all valid Young diagrams to just a sum over all Young diagrams. And with high probability, uh, we will never get these. Uh, invalid Young diagrams like this. And then the final step is, is to determine the asymptotics of the Chauval distribution because we rewrote um, the entanglement fidelity as its expectation value. And here we can, we can take uh, a result from a uh, spectrum estimation, which tells us that uh, if I have a, a, a random variable X, uh, which takes values in the Young diagrams with respect to the Chauval distribution, and I normalize this random variable, then uh, in the limit n to infinity, this uh, random variable converges in distribution to the flat spectrum. 
Okay, so this is a result from spectrum estimation. And uh, if you if you understand this as as a, as a certain law of large numbers, then you can ask uh, what is the corresponding central limit theorem to this to this convergence. And this was proved by Johansson, uh, and it works as follows: you take this random variable x, which uh, takes values in the Young diagrams, and you normalize it. Uh, so you kind of center it and and and, and normalize uh, the, the the random variable. And then this new random variable y converges in distribution again to the spectrum of a, a GUE uh, of a traceless GUE matrix. Okay, so these are uh, d by d matrices whose entries are independent normal variables. And so this this is a very nice result, and we want to actually use this result because it's 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 much easier to compute things with the spectrum of a GUE matrix than it is uh, to compute things with the Young diagram with the lengths of the rows of a Young diagram. And remember that we, we rewrote our entanglement fidelity as this expectation value over, over Young diagrams. And of course, you can, you can make this uh, variable transformation and then it's, it's an expectation value over these normalized and centered uh, Young diagrams. And we now basically want to take this limit and compute things with the spectrum of the GUE matrix. But this is only a conversion in distribution and we have an expectation value. And, and the main technical result of our work is that we, we justify the conversions for this expectation value as well. Okay, so that in the limit n to infinity, we can actually replace this, uh, this y random variable with the spectrum of a GUE matrix, and then here we can compute things. And the result of this is that we, we determine the asymptotics of, of, of corpus interpretation with maximal entangled states. And so we know, we, we re-proof we re, uh, the fact that it converges to one as you take the n to infinity for a fixed uh, local dimension d. And then the, uh, and to first order, this happens in one over n, this convergence, and uh, the, the, the coefficient of this convergence is, is a function of the dimension that's given by d squared minus one over four. Uh, in the last minute or two, uh, let me just quickly mention that there's also a different setting of corpus reportation where instead of fixing the state to be maximal entangled states, you can just try to optimize the entangled state. Uh, and the, the, the interesting thing is that you can again impose the same symmetries on this optimal state and the measurements again, so that you can, uh, so that you again uh, uh, are allowed to use representation theoretic uh, tools to, to try to uh, determine the entanglement fidelity. And uh, Michal Sosinski uh, with colleagues, they again um, uh, did this uh, analysis and, and derived a, a formula for the entanglement fidelity in this optimal case, which is formally very similar to the one that I showed before. Just now you have also a, a maximization problem where you have these coefficients CMU. And you can understand that as a, a weighting of the Schubal distribution. Okay, so these CMU coefficients are all non-negative and uh, they form uh, kind of a new probability distribution on a set of Young diagrams. And we uh, use a different method to again determine the asymptotics of this, of this optimal corpus reputation protocol uh, and, and the result is that here the convergence is actually faster, so it's it's to order one over n squared. And uh, the, the proof consists of two steps. First, we prove a general converse bound for valid for any teleportation uh, purpose teleportation protocol, uh, which gives us the, the the upper bound basically to this convergence. And then for the lower bound, we we relate this optimization problem to a certain eigenvalue problem on the ordered probability simplex. But I don't really have time to to go into that. An open problem here is to actually determine the exact asymptotics of this convergence. So we know the order uh, of n in this result, but what we don't know is the exact coefficient uh, in terms of the local dimension d. So this is an open problem that we left. Okay, uh, so this was it. Uh, thanks for your attention. And here's uh, a nice cool picture of my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Felix, for the nice talk. Uh, I think we should move on, unfortunately, uh, but if people have questions, I mean, please directly them to, to Felix. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, on site, um, and it's uh, Frek Vitiven. I don't know if I pronounce your name properly or... Sorry, and it's about a, um, a result on a converse of the Lee Robinson bound in one dimension, so please. Yeah, thanks a lot for... Um Thanks a lot for, for um, having me here. And um, I will tell you something about this uh, result, a converse to Lee Robinson bounds in one dimension using index theory. And it's a uh, joint work with uh, Michael Walter from Amsterdam 
and uh, Daniel Renard in Stanford. So, um, Mm. Uh, ah, wait, sorry. I, this. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, local. Uh, so this this is about uh, quantum dynamics, and it's about local quantum dynamics, and those are of course ubiquitous in 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 uh, real physical systems. And here I give two very simple uh, examples. So one is a quantum circuit that preserves locality in this this one D example. Another example is we, if we just shift the system by one side to the right, which I will call a translation. So a quiz question for the audience, you know, can a translation be written as a, as a quantum circuit? So that's sort of a maybe easy quiz question. Um, and another important example is if you uh, start with a uh, strictly local Hamiltonian, uh, then we can look at uh, the unitary dynamics that are generated by uh, time evolving along this Hamiltonian. And, um, and, and then, uh, well, a, a question is, is this local dynamics, if the Hamiltonian is local? And the best way to uh, make this quantitative is by looking at uh, the time-evolved operators in the Heisenberg picture. And then there is a very well-known result, I'm sure most people here will be familiar with it, uh, which are the, the leap robinson bounds. So uh, what this says is that if I take, my, if I take an operator supported on some finite sets and I time-evolve it, and then I look at the commutator with another operator which is supported outside some uh, light cone of this, uh, of this original operator. Then we see that the, the commutator uh, is actually exponentially suppressed with the distance outside of this light cone. So that's, that's captured in this maybe slightly complicated looking uh, formula. Um, so uh, another quiz question is, is, can we actually, if we look again at this translation, can we implement it as some Hamiltonian evolution for some finite time? And, and can we actually do this if we allow Hamiltonians which have uh, maybe polynomially decaying tails or uh, which are time dependent? So it's maybe a slightly harder quiz question. At least that was a harder quiz question for me. Um, so, and, and here is another quite uh, specific random example, uh, which are uh, 2D Floquet systems, which have many body localization. It's not so very important uh, what that means, but this is an example that has been studied before and where you see that on the boundary of the system, actually, there's also some uh, quasi-local uh, dynamics, which, for instance, can be winding, and this indicates a certain topological invariant. And this is interesting because it's uh, some uh, dynamics which need not come from a Hamiltonian. So that, that's an, also an interesting example. So to, to summarize this, this motivation, uh, we, uh, we are interested in, in local dynamics, and we can look at strictly local dynamics, such as a uh, circuit or a translation, but we can also look at approximately local dynamics, such as um, uh, evolution along Hamiltonians, which is, of course, a very important uh, thing. And then uh, there is, is the question, uh, when uh, can uh, such dynamics actually be generated locally? So when can they be, they be written, for instance, as quantum circuits, or when can they be written as a Hamiltonian evolution? So that is what this uh, talk is about. And we'll, we'll say something about this in 1D. So first, um, I, I want to say something about uh, strictly local dynamics. There is something called uh, the notion of a QCA, and that just formalizes unitary dynamics which are strictly local. So there are two conditions here. Um, we have a, a QCA, is a, is a quantum channel, and uh, it's a, a unitary quantum channel, and we will say an automorphism, that's essentially the same thing. And the locality is formalized by saying that any uh, operator supported on some finite set is mapped to an operator supported on a set within radius R of this set. So that's, that's this notion, and a lot of people have worked on this, and. Uh, it, it has many applications in understanding uh, quantum many-body physics, but it's also of interest as a, a computational model on its own. So, um, and, and in particular, in 1D, they are very well understood and completely classified, and, and that's what we will build upon, and that's by something called the GNVW index, and slightly informally speaking, what you do is you, you take your chain, you cut it in the middle at some arbitrary location, and then you uh, look at your dynamics, and uh, you measure the number of qubits moving to the right minus the number of qubits moving to the left. And this is the index, so it measures an information flow. 
And um, it, it has a couple of properties. So for instance, the index is zero for a quantum circuit where the information flows as much in both directions. But if we have a, 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 a translation, then we see that the index is actually log D where uh, D is the local Hilbert space I mentioned. And it has many other nice properties. For instance, it's additive with respect to composition and tensor products. So this um, uh, has as a consequence that every one dimensional uh, QCA can be written as a composition of some tensor product uh, of translations and a circuit. And in particular, it also answers the first quiz question. Uh, a circuit is, is, cannot be a translation uh, because they have a different index. This is one way to answer that quiz question. So uh, maybe be a little bit more precise about the definition of this index, and this is actually our reformulation of the original index. So uh, one way to do this is by taking the choice state of, the, of alpha. So you apply alpha to half of a, a maximally entangled state. And again, we uh, cut the system open over some chain, and then we look at uh, the mutual information along these two uh, partitions. And, and you see that indeed uh, these mutual informations uh, really have the interpretation of the information moving left minus the uh, information moving right. And in principle, you could look at now at, at dynamics which are not strictly local and, and look at the same formula and that would still be well defined, but it's not at all clear that this takes discrete values, which it does in the, in the strictly local case. So there's, there's something to be done. So to, uh, to formalize uh, what we, uh, we want to do, we first have to say what are actually these approximately local dynamics that we are interested in. And the idea is that we, uh, we replace the strict locality by something which is like these Lee-Robinson bounds. So uh, what we do is we say that an approximately locality preserving unitary, uh, so an ALPU with f of r tails, where f of r is some decaying function, say exponential or polynomial, uh, on a spin chain is an automorphism of the quasi-local algebra, which is not so important, which is such that any uh, operator supported on an interval uh, and any operator, uh, and, and if, if we map this along alpha and we look at the commutator with an uh, operator which is supported r sides away from this interval, then we see that this commutator uh, goes to zero as the, the distance uh, increases. So it's precisely the same type of bounds was in these Lee-Robinson bounds, but, but note that it's really different because there is no Hamiltonian evolution whatsoever. There's just a single time step dynamic, so it's really different. Um, and our uh, main result, I would say, is that uh, we show that if you are given such an approximate, so such an ALPU in 1D, then there actually exists a sequence of uh, strictly local uh, automorphisms, so of QCAs, with increasing radius that approximates the uh, ALPU. So that's, that's this result, and it's a, yeah, something called strong convergence. So you can think of this as uh, just as in uh, 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 digital quantum simulation, where you just have a Hamiltonian evolution, which you trotterize, and that gives you a quantum circuit, which is strictly local. And as you increase the, the depth of the quantum circuit, the accuracy increases. But now it's really different because there is no Hamiltonian, so you, there is no trotterization, and the proof technique is really different. And uh, in particular, this also allows us to uh, extend the definition of the index, because if we look at the sequence of approximating QCAs, then for large R and independent of, uh, of the approximation, the index of the strict QCA stabilizes to some discrete value, and this will be the index of the ALPU. And if the, uh, if the decay is sufficiently fast, so faster than one over R, which is not very fast, then uh, it's actually given by this mutual information formula that I uh, mentioned before. And um, uh, finally, um, it's also still true that if we have two uh, ALPUs, and um, then they have the same index if and only if they can be connected by some path through the space of ALPUs with uniformly bounded tails. So. Um, so this, it, it still has the, ni the same nice uh, properties as this original index. And this also answers the second quiz question. Uh, this translation cannot be written as a Hamiltonian evolution, uh, provided some very mild conditions on the Hamiltonian. And uh, more generally, uh, alpha can be written as a, a time-dependent uh, quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution, if and only if the index is zero. So in this sense, it's a converse to the Lee-Robinson bounds 
if you're given some dynamics, a one-step dynamics, which satisfies the Lee Robinson bounds, we give an answer for uh, when there actually exists a Hamiltonian that will uh, implement this. And it's quite important here that this Hamiltonian is time-dependent and quasi-local, otherwise that's, uh, we, we don't have anything to say. And, and finally, all the properties of this index actually uh, generalize under just replacing QCA by ALPU, and the role of quantum circuits is replaced by quasi-local evolutions. So uh, this completely classifies ALPU's modulo Hamiltonian evolutions. So to say very briefly something about the proof techniques, and I think I will skip some of this in view of time. So one nice ingredient that, that we use is that uh, if, uh, if you have um, uh, two uh, algebras on a Hilbert space, then we say that A is epsilon included in B, uh, if for every operator in A, there is an operator epsilon near uh, to uh, in, in B, so as, as written here. And there is a very nice theorem from the 80s which says that if A and B are uh, hyperfinite von Neumann algebras and they have this epsilon inclusion, then actually you can rotate A strictly into B by a unitary that's close to uh, the identity. And this, this closeness does not depend on the dimension or the algebra whatsoever. So that's a very uh, useful tool that we uh, use to these, that we apply to these uh, infinite dimensional uh, spin chain algebras. And um, so in view of time, I will go very quickly through this. So the idea is that we use this uh, inclusion theorem to localize uh, the ALPU um, at different sites. And then we use a factorization property, which was already uh, proven in the original GNVW paper on these strictly local sites to glue them together. So this is not very uh, clear probably, but uh, in view of time, I will uh, continue nevertheless. So there are various open problems. Uh, one very frustrating open problem is that this only works for the infinite system and, and not for, for instance, a periodic chain where we actually don't know how, it's, how it should work. Uh, and a very interesting open problem is to go to higher dimensions. In 2D, there is a similar classification and it should be possible to, uh, I, I think something similar should be true in 2D as well. Uh, and, and finally, um, you could also look at noisy QCA, so where you actually don't relax the, localization, the, the locality assumption, but the unitarity assumption, and, and maybe there is something similar that can be said there. So uh, that's, that's all I have to say, and I, I'd be very happy uh, if you're interested to just uh, talk to me in the break or send me any messages online. Uh, that would be great. Thank you very much for the super nice talk and also for sticking to time. It was exactly 12 minutes, really. I mean, and so let's, let's keep moving because we already accumulate a bit of delay uh, to the next talk, which I think is online, uh, exactly by uh, Sihan Okai. Uh, and the title is uh, Hidden Variable Models for Universal Quantum Computation with Magic States on Qubits. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, this great opportunity to contribute this uh, wonderful uh, conference. So I'll tell you about this uh, hidden variable model and this is uh, a joint work with uh, Michael Zurel and Robert uh, Rosandor uh, from UBC, Uni University of British Columbia. Um, so uh, today uh, I'll tell you about uh, a hidden variable model. So this is a particular specific uh, construction uh, that gives rise to a classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation with magic states, and I will be focusing on uh, qubits. So this is an interesting uh, case for us, and uh, I will tell you why. Uh, and the main mathematical object here uh, turns out to be a convex uh, polytrope. Uh, so this is a bounded uh, object inside the space of our emission matrices, uh, which we can see as an Euclidean three in the Euclidean space, uh, and. Uh, so uh, the polytope uh, has finite number of uh, vertices and that will be the main object uh, that I would like to focus in this talk. So uh, the, it turns out that the model that we have uh, in, this, in the model that we, that, we, that we are going to see all quantum states and operations, quantum operations are represented uh, positively uh, using a finite uh, number of states. So the states here are going to correspond to the vertices uh, of the polytope, and as, as I said, it's a finite uh, number of vertices. And positively here means that 
the framework here is a classical simulation uh, using quasi probability representations. Uh, and uh, here uh, it turns out that our model represents everything positively. That uh, means that quasi probability representations becomes actually probability representations. So uh, if you want to put it into context uh, in relation to previous results, uh, so classical simulation, there's a famous uh, gottesman nil theorem uh, which says that any stabilizer circuit is efficiently classically simulatable. So I'll tell you more about stabilizer uh, operations and stabilizer circuits are those circuits that have been constructed using uh, stabilizer operations. Uh, so there's a generalization of this uh, result uh, which only applies to or uh, dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. So this is a result due to Beta et al. Uh, in this uh, result, the quantum, uh, quantum state can be represented positively uh, by its Wigner function, if that's the case, uh, then uh, the, the, the quantum computation can be simulated uh, efficiently classically, uh, classically simulated. So, but the problem here is that, uh, or one, uh, one problem about this uh, approach that we wanted to resolve uh, eventually is, is that the, uh, the result doesn't apply to uh, qubits, uh, which is uh, of interest for the rest of these uh, two, two results. So the three and number four. So number four is the topic of this talk, but just before that, uh, it's also possible to uh, extend uh, Vage et al's uh, result to qubits. Uh, but instead of using Wigner functions, so these are particular quasi probability representations, uh, which essentially relies on operator basis of uh, the space for emission operators, you can, uh, instead of using bases, you can, you can, you can use frames, which are overcomplete uh, essentially, and this gives you uh, a generalized quasi probability distribution. If you do that, then there's a way to extend uh, the, the result in number two to qubits. So this is, uh, uh, so this is our earlier result. Uh, and uh, later on, it turned out that there's a, there's a, there's a way to represent any quantum computation uh, positively, which uh, I'm going to tell you how uh, it works uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes. So just to tell you a bit of, uh, about stabilizer theory, essentially to uh, define uh, what are stabilizer states. Uh, so the main object here, the, it's a very alter, algebraic theory in the sense that it's based on a a uh, finite group, uh, namely the Pauli group. So this is a subgroup of the uh, group of unitary matrices uh, that's uh, acting on uh, n-fold tensor product of C2, so it's the Hilbert space for n qubits. And this uh, group is generated by the Pauli operators. So these are uh, n-fold tensor products of these uh, two by two Pauli matrices, the identity and x, y, z matrices. Uh, so this is a finite group uh, inside the unitary uh, matrices, and there's an. If you look at the normalizer of this group, uh, it turns out to be another finite group. Uh, this is called the Clifford group. And for the qubit case, uh, which I'm only focusing at this point, uh, the generators I'll explain now. So there's the Hadamard gate, the S gate, and there's the two qubit gate, the CNAP gate. They generate the uh, Clifford group. Uh, and stabilizer states uh, are those states that are being obtained uh, from uh, one of these canonical uh, computational bases, which I chose here, this, uh, this n-bit uh, string consisting of only zeros, uh, by applying the elements of the uh, Clifford uh, unitaries. So, uh, so this, uh, this is, again, a finite number of uh, states here. Um, so these are called stabilizer states. Uh, so the model that we are uh, looking at, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a quantum computation with magic states. So it's a certain, a certain uh, framework or computational framework that's been introduced by uh, Bravi and Kitaev. And the idea here is that uh, one can do a universal quantum computation by uh, including extra states uh, to the stabilizer sub theory. So as we know by Gottsman theorem, so this stabilizer sub theory is uh, efficiently classically simulatable. So we cannot really obtain the full power of quantum uh, computers here at this point. Uh, to achieve uh, quantum, quantum universality, uh, there are certain states that have been added. So you see a typical magic state here uh, in this picture. And if you do that, uh, you can uh, implement uh, the T gate, for example, to, to achieve universality. So this would complete, uh, so this could uh, elevate your uh, unitaries from the Clifford uh, unitaries to the, uh, to the whole um, uh, universality. So you can just implement anything approximately using these uh, gate set. 
And uh, if you look at the circuit here, how this works, so you have this uh, stabilizer circuit in the middle, everything uh, is a stabilizer operation in the, in the circuit, uh, and this input state is not a stabilizer state, and then it allows you to implement this T gate, which is uh, missing inside the clipboard group. So this is kind of uh, the idea. Uh, so the main object, as I said, is a convex uh, polytope. Uh, so whenever I say polytope, it's going to be con uh, mean convex. Uh, so uh, this uh, polytope is uh, denoted by lambda n. This consists of uh, Hermitian matrices uh, that are of trace one. And the trace with a projector onto any stabilizer state is non-negative. So you this is the uh, precise definition. So it's a nice uh, concrete object. And the set of vertices will be denoted by the N. Uh, so this is the label and the actual operators will be denoted by A alpha. So these are the Hermitian uh, operators that sit on the vertices of this uh, polytope. And if you look at the uh, definition and if you're familiar with polytopes, you will notice that this is actually a polar dual uh, of the stabilizer polytope. That's the uh, convex hull of these stabilizer states. And this object is being, uh, can be also used to study the facets uh, of the stabilizer polytope, which is also very important to understand. Uh, but the, our approach is to use this polytope to, uh, to be able to do classical simulation. Uh, so this is our main result. Uh, so let me uh, explain uh, the notation and what's going on here. So because of the definition, it immediately implies that this polytope contains the uh, density operators of so all n qubit states. So if you pick a quantum state, uh, you can express it uh, non-uniquely, of course, uh, as a probabilistic mixture of the vertices. So you can think of it as a probability uh, distribution on the set of uh, vertices uh, as, as a function p out here. So this is the first component. And uh, what we are interested in, in this magic uh, state, uh, quantum computation with magic state framework, we start with a quantum state, and then we apply a sequence of uh, power measurements. To, be, to, to implement the uh, quantum computation. That's essentially the framework that we have. For each power measurement, uh, we need to understand how the vertices uh, transform uh, in our framework. So meaning that, uh, so if you take a, a projector that corresponds to one of the Pauli observables, so here A is a two and bit string, so I just label uh, the Pauli observable that we're looking at, and S is the outcome, zero or one. So that projector, uh, when acted on the uh, vertex, it turns out again. You can uh, it turn, turns out it falls inside the polytope. In other words, you can express it as a probabilistic mixture of the vertices again. So this gives you another function q. Uh, so this time it's a probability function on the uh, set of vertices times the outcomes. Uh, so these are two components. The first one uh, describes the state. The other one describes the measurements. And if you combine them uh, in in this way. Uh, then you can reproduce the Born rule. So this is essentially what it means to simulate uh, the quantum computation. Uh, we want to reproduce this uh, Born rule probabilities uh, using these two, two other uh, probability functions. Okay. Uh, so uh, the idea here is that the one thing that I don't mention, which uh, I mentioned in the previous earlier results was the keyword is the e efficiency. Uh, so the general question is that here, uh, what is the uh, largest subpolytope in, inside this polytope that gives us efficient classical simulation? Uh, so there is one particular polytope that we already identify. So this is uh, the convex hull of certain vertices. Uh, these vertices are called of CNC type. Uh, and CNC means here closed non-contextual. So non-contextual here is the keyword, which is uh, contextual is a notion from uh, quantum foundation. So these, uh, which I'm not going to go into, but these vertices have very particular structure. They're easy, easier to describe uh, and possible to classify. Uh, and whenever your uh, quantum state falls inside this subpolytope, it turns out it can be efficiently classically uh, simulatable. So that is, uh, it's quite uh, neat. Uh, if, you, if you take a single qubit, for example, the polytope lambda n, the whole polytope turns out to be a cube. Uh, cube. Uh, so there are eight vertices and all the vertices turn out to be a CNC type. So these red arrows uh, tells us here where the vertices go after, uh, after measurement. So all of this uh, structure is known for a single qubit. So it's kind of the easiest case. Uh, but if you look at the two qubit uh, situation, it gets uh, complicated very quickly. And one reason for that is, well, the main reason for that is uh, the, um, 
the partially ordered set of isotropic subspaces, or in other words, essentially uh, abelian uh, subgroups of uh, the Pauli group, uh, with the, the, you see these, uh, the blue dots are the ones with a single generator and the green, uh, red dots are the ones with two generators. Um, so this is a picture uh, of the, uh, the two qubit case. And in the first line, uh, you see the coordinates in the Pauli basis of a CNC type vertex. What is important here is that the coordinates are zero uh, plus minus or plus minus one. Uh, so recently we have shown that if it's possible to move beyond the CNC type vertices and there are new class of vertices which still gives you a larger polytope than the CNC vertices but still uh, preserves the efficiency property. And here's uh, the type of vertex that we have uh, pinned down well, the only difference is that there are these plus minus one over two coordinates appearing and for more complicated vertices, you, you have uh, different different rational numbers appearing. So it's an interesting structure uh, uh, starts, to, starts to appear in, in these vertices. Uh, and furthermore, you can, you can take this polytope for two qubits and map it to n qubits and you can, you can obtain a larger, larger sub polytope than the CNC uh, type vertices. Uh, in this way. So the, in general though, uh, it's an open problem to describe uh, the all, all set of vertices uh, of the polytope lambda n. Uh, there's a simplification one can consider, which is symmetry. So essentially the Clifford group acts on the set of vertices and it breaks the vertices into smaller, relatively smaller number of orbits. So this is uh, a hopeful uh, thing. Well, probably helps to understand classified vertices in a way. Uh, so the complete enumeration is known for n is equal to one, of course, because it's just a cube, there are eight vertices. And for n is equal to two, you see the number of vertices jumps uh, quite uh, to a larger number, which is 22,320. Uh, but if you look at the number of orbits under the Clifford group, uh, it turns out that there are actually eight distinct, ver uh, distinct orbits. So the cyan C type uh, vertices for the two qubit day constitute two distinct orbits and there are six other orbits. And this is one of those uh, orbits that lies outside the cyan C type uh, vertices. And we also know how the structure of this uh, vertex looks like. And the idea here is to use some graph theoretical methods uh, in an ad hoc way for two qubits, but uh, it's kind of hard to understand the general structure and that's, uh, that's an open, open problem. Uh, and from the phenomenology side, the negativity that, uh, that happens in, occurs in the Wigner representation case, for example, or other uh, generalized quasi-property representations that determines the hardness of the simulation. Uh, in, in, in this uh, simulation method, it actually disappears. So everything represented positively. So the main question is where the hardness is hiding. So it's, uh, it's important to characterize the physical properties that determine the Efficiency, efficiency of the classical simulation in this current uh, current uh, model. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank uh, for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Fihan, for your for nice talk. And again, we keep moving. Uh, and now our next speaker is on site. Uh, is Daniel Stig uh, Frank? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, sorry. Um, and the topic is uh, fast and robust uh, quantum state tomography with a uh, few basis measurements. Thanks. So thanks, David. I guess. Well, I guess we also all happy to have a little break. Looks good, but I guess uh, this is the second slide, and I can't seem to. 
this is not work. Ah, yeah, now it's now it's working. Okay, so I guess I should start, right? Okay, so thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to talk about fast and robust quantum state tomography from few basis measurements. This is joint work with Fernando Brandon and uh, Richard Kuhn. And, well, as you can probably tell from the title, this is a work on, on tomography of quantum states of low rank. And the problem is as follows. We're given access to some copies of an unknown state rho, uh, and we're given the promise that it's of approximate low rank. We can then perform measurements on individual copies of the states. So in particular, we're not allowed to take a few copies and do a collective measurement, only uh, really one at a time. And our goal is to then obtain some classical description of some state rho prime that is epsilon close uh, in trace distance to rho. So um, this is essentially the setup down there. We're just given the state rho. We maybe apply some uh, circuit to it, measure it, get the uh, histogram in that basis, and then repeat this. And this is a, a widely studied problem. And there are many uh, different resources you might optimize for. For instance, the number of copies of rho you need to do this. Uh, the number of different measurement settings you actually need. Um, also, how expensive the classical post-processing is, and maybe uh, also the classical memory, because it turns out that this is one of the main bottlenecks for current approaches. And there are also some other things you might want to have. For instance, that it is robust, both just statistical uh, errors, but also just noise in the data. Also, maybe you want to have an online implementation, that is, you want to already start the reconstruction process while you're still gathering the data, not have to first gather all the data and, and then start doing it. Uh, and you want to have the measurements to be as simple as possible. And, well, in our, there have also been some lower bounds on the scaling of these resources for this task. So, for instance, in the work by Wolf et al., they showed that the number of basis settings required actually has to scale with the rank of the state. And the work by Harrow uh, and others, they also showed that the number of copies scales with the dimension and the rank squared. Um, and these also give you a runtime on the, uh, sorry, lower bound on the runtime because you have to read in all the data. And also in the memory, because well, if you have a rank R state and dimension D, you need at least DR parameters. Um, and other works have reached optimal performance in some of these parameters. So for instance, uh, there have been many, many works on using compressed sensing methods to solve exactly this problem, and they are essentially optimal when it comes to the number of basis settings you have to measure. However, they um, can be quite expensive to implement. Uh, other methods like projected lead squares, they give you the exact, like they give you the optimal scaling in the number of state copies you need, but then they are suboptimal in other parameters. Whereas here in the method I'm going to present, we are essentially optimal uh, in all parameters and improve upon the runtime um, if you uh, are okay with paying uh, for a, like, if, uh, if you just consider the fact that we have a worse dependency and the error. So you see the epsilon uh, to the minus two everywhere where we wouldn't want to have one. Um, I should also say that our algorithm is robuster than the previous ones, both qualitatively and quantitatively, in the sense that we can uh, show that it's robust to essentially all kinds of different noise models. Um, and here in this table, I'm everywhere suppressing polylog terms, and also uh, this is all to a, like a constant probability of success for this reconstruction. Now, um, the intuition uh, of how we obtain our sample complexity and basis setting bounds is that we get a very straightforward way of converting uh, a way of quantifying how well a set of random measurements can distinguish two states to a sample complexity bound. And uh, the why we obtain speedups for the runtime comes from the fact that our algorithm is extremely robust, so at all times we can just work with approximate representations of the underlying states and this you get um, speed ups from that if you choose the, the measurements wisely. And this is essentially also the same reason why we obtain uh, speed ups for the memory as well, because you, if you choose your measurements wisely, then you don't have to store a lot. And in this way, we, we can uh, obtain better scalings for all of these resources. Now, um, our algorithm is also a bit different in its style than the other ones I mentioned before because they try to somehow solve some linear inversion problem. We do an iterative algorithm. Um, and it's based on showing that uh, if you update somehow the guesses of your state in a smart way, then the relative entropy between 
your current guess and the target state always uh, decreases. And essentially, the idea of the algorithm is as follows. You'll always have some guess sigma for the current state you have, so for the state you want to learn. And uh, then you're just going to do some, some measurements and see if you can distinguish that state from um, your current guess from the actual state by s at, most, at, at least epsilon. And if you're able to distinguish it this way, then you can actually improve what the guess, uh, your guess on the state. So, as I mentioned before, this is um, done by, uh, in a way that the relative entropy between your current guess and the target state always decreases. And this update rule is just by given by um, like updating some, some Gibbs state. So, if you can always assume that your previous guess was represented by some Gibbs state, like the sigma t, and then if you pick the update in a smart way, uh, like this, to ju so you just penalize this direction you use to distinguish, then you actually get closer in relative entropy. And then the uh, idea now we see from, from the last slide is that if we know how to pick these um, projections P to distinguish the states, then we also know how to make progress in this algorithm. And then what we do is that we instantiate um, bounds like this one that we show in the, in the paper, which essentially tells you that if you, for instance, take a, a random approximate four design and you measure uh, in that in the basis defined by, by that unitary, then the, you essentially can distinguish two states up to the um, Hilbert-Schmidt distance between these two states with, with a very high uh, probability, um, in particular constant. And these follows by some moment bounds on the moments of, of, of this random variable that you can easily compute. Um, and then the idea is now of, of the whole algorithm is, well, if you, let's say you measure in a few random bases and then you compare the histograms of, of the results for your guess and the target state, if the states are distinguishable under that basis measurement, then you know how to make progress, you know how to update your state and then you move on. Uh, if they are indistinguishable, well, you can repeat this a couple of times, and because of the bound above, you know that they, if they are indistinguishable um, after measuring a couple of times, then it probably means that the states uh, are close in Hilbert-Schmidt distance. Um, and this is just some illustration of, of really how it works. You just, and for the very simple case of uh, um, qubit, so you start with the maximally mixed state, the red dot is the guess, and then you just do some plus or <laughs> computational basis measurements, update it the way I mentioned before, and then you see you quickly get close to your, your target state. Um, and, well, how do we show that this thing actually converges? Um, if you pick the initial state to just be, your initial guess should be the maximally mixed state, you know that the maximal initial entropy is at most log of the dimension. So, and every time you get a good guess, you uh, decrease this relative entropy by epsilon squared, so you need only epsilon um, log d to the epsilon to minus two iterations to actually get very close to the state. And we know that we need at most one basis setting for, or at least a constant number of basis settings to, to decrease this relative entropy by epsilon squared. So this way you, you can easily get like all the sample complexity and basis setting bounds I mentioned before. But, um, Recall that we only get uh, guarantees in the Hilbert-Schmidt um, norm, but then you can easily convert this into a trace bound, um, sorry, trace norm bound by just paying a, a, a rank factor. And um, I would just, again, the number of measurement settings you need for this is just given by the number of iterations of, of the algorithm. So. We can also extend this algorithm to other measurement setups. So the only thing you actually need is an analog of, of this equation. And um, for instance, by playing a bit around with the representation theory of the Clifford group, you get a similar uh, statement for cl random Clifford bases. But here you have to pay this extra rank factor, both in the Hilbert-Schmidt and also the probability. And uh, we can also do play a similar game if you are allowed to measure k um, subgroups of qubits at a time. And here we have this exponentially worse dependency on the distinguishability. Um, we know that it has to get exponentially worse once you group 
uh, qubits. Um, however, it would be very nice to actually improve this constant, the square root of 18. Again, this follows by some, from some uh, representation theory of the um, unitary group, but I think uh, I would be very happy to get a square root of 2 over there instead of 18, but I don't really know how to do that. Um, and of course, it also, this also begs the question of how to actually improve these bounds if you have some assumptions on role uh, in sigma, let's say you know a bit about how much entanglement there is in those states, whether you can actually improve these bounds. Um, and last but not least, I would also like to mention that the algorithm is actually practical. So if you, we did a very uh, simple implementation of this algorithm and uh, it actually performs better than these other methods I mentioned before. And this leads me uh, to our um, open questions. So one of the main open questions is how do we actually improve this dependency on the error? Because as, as we've seen in the first slide, actually the number of basis settings and the sample complexity is um, over by a factor of epsilon to the minus two. This we don't see in the numerics. So it's likely that, I mean, you, you could actually improve this and, and get then optimal sample complexity and also number of basis settings uh, promises with this sort of algorithm, which um, would show that it is essentially optimal in various um, parameters at the same time and more or less solve this, this problem up to the, the runtime, which is still, um, all, even if you disregard the error um, dependency a bit over what we want. And as I mentioned before, this, this whole problem of actually improving the bounds we have for local measurements, this is uh, closely related to getting concentration inequalities for random tensors or polynomials of Gaussian random variables. There have been some interesting papers lately on that. So that's also something I'm quite interested in doing. Uh, chat to me if you have ideas. And with that, I'd like to thank you for staying so late. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice talk, Daniel. Uh, so let's keep moving. We are already half uh, through the, the session. Also, we still need a bit more of energy, but I think the, the last talks are as interesting a, a, as the ones we already had. So the next one is online, and I think it's Alvaro Alhambra. Hi, Alvaro. Yeah. And OK, it will be about uh, here, improved thermal area law and quasi-linear time algorithm for quantum gibbs states. So please. Okay, thanks a lot, David. Uh, I'll try to stay on time. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to present work on uh, quantum thermal states, as the title says. And it's in collaboration with my two great authors, Tomotaka Kuwahara and Nanura Ganshu. OK, so let me just uh, jump into it. So I guess the, the general problem that we're trying to solve, and many people in this in the previous talks, have you also been trying to solve in different ways? Is a quantum many body problem, no? And you know, the, the way I will phrase it in my in the context of my talk is, you know, when can when and how can we compute physically relevant phenomena for for models that are basically local models, no? Described by a local Hamiltonian on the lattice, no? Uh, yes, yeah, so of course, this this problem is as many phases, no? And it's very important in many fields, no? Of course, here we're talking more about quantum information, but also computation, condensed matter, high energy physics, and other things, no? But as we all know, it's very hard, no? Because uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space is exponential, no? So what you need to do is you try, you have to try to find the smart ways of avoiding this problem, no? So for instance, Daniel was showing us one way of doing this in, the, in, in that context, no? So I'm gonna show you another one in a different context, no? So in physics, um, what states do we usually care about, no? It's, I, I would say it's mostly two, no? <laughs> uh, one is, of course, the ground state, which is the most important eigenstate in the spectrum of a uh, Hamiltonian, no? But the other one, which is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, is the thermal state, no? which is just the exponential of the, of the Hamiltonian, no? So what do we want uh, from, 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 this, from these two states? Well, basically we want efficient ways of approximating them and efficient ways that allow us to extract physical information, no? So expectation values or other things, no? And also we would like to understand why this works, you know? What is the physical reason why these things work, no? So usually, well, sometimes the way you can answer this is by attention networks, no? Which is what I'm gonna be also focusing on here, no? Uh, briefly. Okay, so that, so with this we basically have a bit of a, a research program that I'm gonna I'm gonna describe quickly. You know, 
which is basically we start with the with our physics input, no, which is that we have the definition of our thermal state, and we want to study these states, no. And one one important property of this type of state when the Hamiltonian is local is that the correlations are somehow localized, no, around your your lattice, no. And one interesting way of stating this this fact is usually through an area of, of a measure of correlations, no, which basically will state will, will tell you something like like the you know the half of the system A and half and the other half of the system B are only correlated through a mutual boundary, no? or the amount of correlations is bounded by the size of the boundary. No? And one reason why this is interesting is because it's usually related, at least for, for, for pure states, this is better understood. For mixed states, there's many open questions, actually. But the idea is that this type of statement is related to the existence of classical algorithms for approximating your thermal state. No? So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about, about the direction, these two directions separately. No? First, we have an area law. And then we also have an algorithm. No? We, we would like to connect the two, but we don't know how yet. OK, so what is the area law, just a bit more precisely? Uh, so the area law is basically an upper bound on a, on a quantity that defines uh, the measures correlations. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about the mutual information, which is basically I have a state uh, bipartite, row AB, which is going to be the thermal state. I divide it into two, row A, uh, yeah, a and B. So you imagine the, the lattice, no? and they have a mutual boundary, as in the picture before. So this is just, um, this is just telling you how, how, how far row AB is from the product of the marginal, no? so just a measure of correlations. So it's a quite well-known result from uh, a few years ago, which is the thermal area law. And basically what this tells me is that the mutual information is upper bounded by this, this, this number. And this number is two times beta, where beta is the inverse temperature, times this thing, which is the norm of the interaction, the interaction Hamiltonian between the two, the two parts of the system. No? So I can, I can divide my local Hamiltonian in three parts. Two of them are local, H of A and H of B. And H of I is the one that acts on their mutual boundary. No? So the norm of this basically scales like the boundary between the two systems. No? So the point of this statement is that basically we have this dependence, no, which of course goes to zero and beta goes to zero, because in that case we have a product state. No? But uh, but this also scales like the boundary, no. And one interesting thing about this statement is actually the the proof is extremely simple, no. It's really just two lines, and I mean, sadly I I, I, I guess I don't have time to write it here, no. But uh, just you know go to the paper and look it up. It's really nice. Uh, but so so we have an improvement on this, of course, no. And this is our result. This is our first main result of this paper. And the result is essentially an improved dependence on the on the temperature. So with some more involved techniques, and basically I, I list them here. I mean, I would like to go more in depth in them because I think some of them are really interesting. But with this, basically, we managed to get a, a better um, temperature dependence of the area law. And what we get is that instead of a beta, we have a beta to the two thirds. And somehow this should this should suggest it's not quite the same, but it should suggest that somehow when you when you have some evolution in binary time instead of in real time, your correlation spread, um, let's say, sublinearly, no? so like diffusively, instead of, instead of linearly. This is a bit of a pushed analogy, but maybe it gives you some idea. And let me just mention that actually, in the, in the proof of this, we use quite a powerful uh, tool, tool from the study of, um, of ground states, uh, of area loss for ground states, and of tension neighbor approximation from, from ground states. And actually, this takes the form of, so this, this, is, this is from this paper, or unity in this paper by Ara et al. And this just takes the form of, you take have um, some, some Hamiltonian, which is in this case is part of your Hamiltonian, and you take powers of it. And we would just want to study what is the bond dimension. So what is the, what is the complexity of the tensor network representation of this, of this polynomial of a Hamiltonian? No? And this is really the nice, the nice key ingredient that we introduce here in the study of uh, thermal states for this, for this area law. No? Uh, OK, so what is the one? Yeah, it's just a bit more of a physics motivation for this. What is the real, usually the dependence of the mutual information with temperature, no? since we have an improvement? An interesting thing is that from, from calculations in physics, people have, people have shown that in many models, very simple models like IC model or free fermions, things like this, the temperature dependence is actually like log of beta. So it's actually much slower than, than the one I showed you before, no? the upper bounds we know. The idea, though, is that the, the more like extreme temp dependence on beta, like linear or sublinear or whatever, actually have to do with very complex models. No? So for instance, with QMA hard, hard instances of local Hamiltonians that somehow encode diff difficult computations in their low energy subspace. No? Uh, one example of this that we think is, is quite nice and illustrates the, our result a bit is this um, a local Hamiltonian constructed in Gottesman and Hastings. And if you look at this, basically at the thermal state at low temperatures, you can see that the mutual information scales like beta to the one fourth, which is not quite what we have, but it's, 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 it's getting there. No? So as I said, we proved beta to the third, third, two thirds, but actually we, we conjecture that the dependence on the mutual information is like beta to the one half. And this actually goes in the direction of what I was saying, you know, that somehow the, your correlations in, in imaginary time spread, spread diffusively. You know? uh, this is just sort of uh, the analogy again. You know? 
OK, so I can just move now to the second result, uh, which is a tensor network approximation of the thermal state. No? This is the second result of the paper. And I just, I'm just going to state it briefly. So basically, what we construct is a, an operator, which is a tensor, uh, an MPO, a tensor network, uh, which approximates your, um, your thermal state in one norm very well. So very well, meaning epsilon well. And the nice thing about this tensor network is that it has a, it has a small bond dimension. And in fact, it's, it's this expression here, which maybe is not so easy to read. Uh, but you, what, what you have to understand from this is that this is basically slower than any polynomial. No? So this is sub, sublinear, no? sublinear, whatever. It's basically e to the square root of, uh, of log n. No? With polynomial, I mean polynomial in n, of course. No? Uh, and then if you translate this into an algorithm, basically what you need to do is you need to take this bond dimension and just sort of, you know, paste it n times no? in, your, in, your, in your computer. No? So basically to, to go from the bond dimension to the, cost of, to the time cost of, the, of your algorithm, you just have to write n. So what we end up with is a quasi-linear algorithm for constructing an MPO, an MPO approximation of a thermal state. Okay, uh, just some, some more motivation for this, for this construction that we have. So one nice thing about this field is that, you know, there's quite a few heuristic algorithms for, um, for thermal states and for related things, no? and they seem to work pretty well, actually. So for instance, there's this one, no? which is quite related to ours. And actually, the dependence from the heuristics is thought to be like basically close to linear. No? You just have to really just put the small blocks into, into, into a line, so this takes linear time. No? Um, so somehow, our result is getting close to the performance of the, of the, of the real algorithms that people use. No? Of course, it's, it's, it's very likely that our algorithm, the algorithm we propose is not necessarily the best in practice, no? but we believe that this existence sort of justifies the success of the, of the heuristic algorithms. No? I guess that's the point of deriving uh, rigorous algorithms. No? Um, and just um, a small comment uh, about what happens in higher dimensions, because the algorithm only works in one dimension. And the one, the one we built is that you can do some, something slightly different, and this is done in this paper of Wonder et al. This has to do with this cluster expansion, for those who've heard of this. And basically, what you get is something that is polynomial in, in system size, but also scales a bit, a bit badly with the temperature. Um, OK, so let me just briefly describe the algorithm. So basically, what we need to do is you, we just need to sort of you know, take some operators with small support and then just multiply sort of a chain of them. So the approximation is as follows. Basically, we, had, we divide our chain into chunks of a certain length, which is L0. Uh, and then for each of these chunks, we take some, somehow the local Hamiltonian in this chunk, which is h of j, and then we take a Taylor approximation of this exponential of the Hamiltonian, of this local, uh, of this local um, Hamiltonian uh, from a region of, of length L0. No? And basically what we do is we just multiply many, many very, very many, many of these in somehow, and somehow this is done in a funny way, because um, uh, first you multiply with like a minus beta, and then you multiply with positive beta, and then you multiply with minus beta, but somehow you do it in a way it's like it's a bit of like a sip somehow. You do it in a way that in the end you get basically a contribution from each of the segments, no? And the, and the form of this has to do with the fact that we have to use something related to like thermal de Robinson bounds, but I shouldn't get too much into this. And one nice thing actually again is that the a key element in our in our analysis and the key, the thing that really pushed us beyond the what was what pre, maybe what previous results expected is this uh, this bound on the bond dimension of the powers of the Hamiltonian. So it's basically the same technical ingredient. I mentioned for the for the area law, no? so somehow the same the same tool that allows to derive the area law also allows us to derive the the performance on the algorithm, no? So that's so you can see that there's some connection there, no? Of course. Um, okay, and actually let me just uh, one last remark. It's actually a, a small improvement. This is from a, actually this slide is from a more recent work uh, of mine. Is that somehow uh, the one dimension I showed you here grows with n grows with system size, but this is because we want to approximate the whole thermal state. So one thing you can show kind of nicely is that if you only want to approximate local properties, so you can you want to approximate expectation values of operator operator A that lives in a small region, you can actually get rid of this dependence on n. No? Uh, and the way is actually fairly simple. And basically, the one dimension you get, as you can see here, it depends on a few things. So the thermal correlation length and the size of the support of A and epsilon, of course, but it does not depend on system size. So this is even actually this is actually even getting closer to do, to what you know algorithms usually usually do. No? And actually, yeah, there was another there was another paper along these lines that actually got rid of the dependence on the correlation length. Um, that's just to mention that. And yeah, and I guess with this, I just want to conclude. And hopefully, the message of this quick talk—I mean, I couldn't get into any details—is that you know thermal states are complex, but they can be tamed, and that with some care and with the right technical tools, 
the locality of the Hamiltonian can be inherited by the thermal state, no? And this allows for like efficient descriptions and other interesting things, no? Uh, yeah, so this is just a summary of the results and the techniques. And let me just say that there's, I think there's a fair amount of open, qu open questions in this area, of nice open questions. I'm just gonna state them here. And thank you, and this is the archive reference. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Alvaro. Okay, so uh, I think we should keep moving to try to make it on yep. time in the end. Uh, so I think our next speaker is David here, he's on site. Uh, David Trillo, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, quantum physics needs complex numbers. Well, thank you for the introduction, David. And I would also like to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak here. Despite well, the, the title, this uh, work is really about real numbers. It's uh, more precisely is what can we say about quantum theory if we keep everything the same and we don't allow to use complex numbers. We just use real numbers, so everything is the same, real Hilbert spaces, like uh, tensor products over the real numbers and so on. Um, this question is uh, very general, and a lot of people have asked this question. Is first of all one of the hmm. oh. so it's one of the oldest questions in physics stack exchange, but <laughs> it uh, really goes back all the way to Schrödinger when he first uh, was writing his equations. He, he, after writing them, he was really uh, unsatisfied with the fact that there was this imaginary unit there, and he tried to remove it for like a year, and at the end he gave up, and he said, okay, no, the complex numbers really are needed. Uh, but it's not only Frank and Schrodinger, it's uh, a lot of people, and also a lot of people were there first introduced to quantum mechanics, including myself in their undergrad. Uh, they see that these complex numbers in this theory for the first time are an essential part of the theory. It's not like in electromagnetism where this is a nice trick uh, to represent wave functions um, so that you don't have to deal with cosines and sines. You just make complex exponentials and at the end you take real parts. But in quantum theory this doesn't seem to be the case. And this is a problem that has been tackled by a lot of people. Most of, uh, there are many approaches to why this is, why this is necessary. But most of them are purely theoretical. Like, uh, for example, in all the reconstructions of quantum mechanics, at the end you end up putting this uh, small axiom of uh, local tomography to distinguish the uh, real Hilbert spaces from complex Hilbert spaces. And there are other more mathematical uh, deep theories about this. But we want something that we can really verify with an experiment. And as quantum information theorists, we, we will essentially look at the statistics of uh, of experiments like the Bell scenario. But first, let's see, because uh, when, you, when you first think about this, the, very, the obvious, most obvious thing to do is like, okay, I have complex Hilbert spaces. Let's just rep may take a representation of the complex numbers in a two-dimensional real vector space. And okay, there you, this is one way to do this. Uh, so but this angle is really bad. So you just take one of your states, complex states, and you add two more dimensions, which I call here zero and one. This is another qubit. And you can encode the, all the information about the imaginary numbers in these extra dimensions. So here I show you one possible map for the states and one possible map for the operators, which, um, which gives a representation of the complex structure in, uh, with only real numbers. And in a very nice way, because unitaries go to orthogonal matrices, all measurements go to measurements, and all the probabilities are preserved. But this is only if you have one Hilbert space. What happens if you have more? And in particular, we want to study the effect of locality on this. So experiments, uh, so situations such as this, this is the, I've drawn here the Bell scenario, in which there are two parties, Alice and what I, I call him Charlie, because Bob will come later. And they share a, one quantum state, and they do some local operations on this quantum state, and then you want to look at the behavior, at the statistics that you get from this. And this is how you, for example, can distinguish uh, quantum theory from classical theory. 
And you can, we want to start, we want to ask the question if we can distinguish quantum theory with complex numbers, with quantum theory with uh, real, only real numbers. But uh, this is very important because there's a, trivially you can represent every complex number with a real number. We want it to preserve the locality structure. So we want local operators on A to be represented with local operators on A still when you go to the real numbers. So the fact that global phases don't matter in quantum theory means that in this tensor product structure that you have of the Hilbert spaces of Alisa and Charlie, um, this operator that you have used here, this representation of the imaginary unit, J, has to really commute with the tensor product. And intuitively, you can see that this doesn't work with this, uh, with this obvious map because there's only one extra qubit. And Alice and Charlie cannot both have access to this extra qubit at the same time because we want to preserve locality. There's a way to do this if you allow for what is called a universal rivet. You can add just one, cu one real qubit but then, and, and encode everything, but then there's no, the, the locality structure is not preserved. So in this situation, this can be solved. This problem can be solved with a different mapping. You see, okay, this, uh, so one qubit is not enough. Let's add two qubits. Uh, one for Alice and one for Charlie. And indeed, if you do this and you select an appropriate two-dimensional subspace of this, so this zero with a bar will be a logical zero qubit and so on, um, you can take the same map and map the operators the same to the space of real Hilbert spaces. And then what you see is that the action of J is local. So J, if Alice uh, uses J, uh, applies J to her part of the system, it's the same, it makes the same effect of his, as if Charlie is applying J to the same system. And of course, it, uh, the action is just multiplying by I, no, in this uh, representation thing. So, okay, so in a Bell scenario, there's no difference. Every behavior that you can get with complex quantum numbers, with a theory of, com of quantum mechanics with complex quantum numbers, you can get with real Hilbert spaces. You have to increase the dimension, but we don't care about the dimension. Um, okay, so, in general, this uh, situation can be extended to any number of parties as long as you only look an, at one state that they all share. However, if you have uh, more interesting causal structures, such as this one, uh, there is actually a separation, and this is what we find in this work. So let me talk a bit about this. So in this, uh, we call this causal structure the SOP scenario, and we have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, but Alice and Bob share one state, and Bob and Charlie share another state, and these two states are independent. So there's immediately a problem. What should, the, what should be the representation of, Bob, of Bob's operators? We cannot apply the same trick, because you have, if you try to do the same thing as before, for this state you get two qubits, one which you send to Alice, one to Bob, and Bob receives another qubit from here. So now Bob has two qubits that you were wanted to use to represent your imaginary unit. What should Bob do on that? Okay, the obvious thing would be, okay, the compose Bob's operators spatially, and now apply this representation map twice. Uh, there's a big problem with this, is that this map is not too positive. So measurements that Bob applies will not go to measurements. So the representation of measurements, the image of a measurement, of a predictive measurement and this map is not in general a measurement. So this breaks down, and in fact, this difficulty is unsurmountable because there is a difference. Um, and we can do it a bit more general. We can do the sub-scenario with shared randomness so that, that the states that Alice, Bob, and Bob Charlie have are not just uh, independent, but they can be generated using a, a classical random variable. Um, so in this causal structure, all the behaviors that you will get with an experiment take this uh, form where, okay, and then you can, in the normal theory of quantum mechanics, these operators can be complex but we are uh, requiring that all of them are real. Um, and this is what makes the difference. And the, the, the main theorem that we prove is that if we have uh, a, a behavior that is really close to having a uniform outcome probability for Bob, and that violates a certain, bell inequ a certain linear inequality, which I will introduce later, uh, it almost achieves the, the, the maximum value for all outcomes of Bob, then this behavior doesn't admit a decomposition of the previous form of uh, like this. If you only 
if you only allow for the use of real numbers. And the key idea is that there will be some, so for, I will show you the sketch of the proof for epsilon equals to zero. And the, the idea is that if you sum over all outcomes of Bob, the state that you get after some local operations here, the, the global state, has to be separable. And if you only allow for real numbers, it has to be real separable, which means that it has to be a convex combination of product states where these product states have to be real. So no, yeah. Okay. So, ah, and yes, of course, this uh, epsilon is super tiny, but numerically we can do way better. So this is, this we can prove analytically, and then numerically we can say that uh, this is six square root two is the maximal quantum value of uh, a certain in a, uh, linear functional, but with real numbers you can only get up to 6.66, and the, I mean, this is still not optimal probably, we don't know yet. Okay, so the idea of the proof is that there's some self-testing in this scenario. If you want the maximal quantum uh, value of this uh, operator, you can do it with this uh, prescription, which is just a thing. Uh, this is the, the operator that we're using. This is just the sum of three CHSH inequalities, which is why it's called the CHSH3 uh, inequality. Um, and because it's the sum of three CHSH inequalities, it's bound by three times the value of the CHS inequality. And you can write this uh, as a sum of squares. And because you can write this as a sum of squares, then if you have a maximal violation, this gives you algebraic relations of your op measurement operators and states. And with this, you can apply a certain local operation on your states, with, which you can take, you can, you can do this with only real numbers and get a state that is not real separable. And that is essentially how it goes. And then mm, looking into more detail, you can give a really small epsilon bound on this. And let me finish with a short comment on numerics, is that you can do a standard MPA hierarchy, you just modify it a little bit to account for the fact that you have real numbers. So the, you get four moment matrices, one for its uh, outcome of Bob, and when you add them all up, the thing you, ha you have is that if you are in real quantum mechanics, you need to have a positive, uh, the, partial the partial transpose will not modify your moment matrix. You can think about this in the terms of states, if you have a real separable state, the partial transpose does not modify the state because everything is real, and if you do a transpose, it's like doing a, um, an adjoint in real numbers. Okay, and that's it. So we have found that real quantum mechanics and standard quantum mechanics can be distinguished with an experiment as long as you uh, have more faith in the, our current notions of locality than on uh, the notion of complex numbers. And this is just one of many other reasons why complex numbers are needed to formulate quantum mechanics, but uh, this is, as far as I'm aware, this is the first one that can be verified by an experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for the nice talk, and also for keeping in time. We are more or less back to normal now. Uh, okay, so next talk is online. Uh, hi, Tamara, it's by Tamara Kohler, uh, and the title is General Conditions for Universality of Quantum Hamiltonians. So please, Tamara. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, um, and thank you all for being here. So today, as David said, I'm gonna be speaking about general conditions for universality of quantum Hamiltonians. So this is some joint work I carried out with Stephen Piddick, Johannes Bausch, and Toby Cubitt. And what we're interested in here is looking at the ideas behind Hamiltonian simulation, and in particular, looking at universal Hamiltonians. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna be talking about Hamiltonian simulation. And as you all know, there are two different ideas of Hamiltonian simulation in the literature. So the first one is digital Hamiltonian simulation, and the second one is analog Hamiltonian simulation. And the type of simulation I'm gonna be interested in this talk is analog Hamiltonian simulation. So in analog simulation, what we're interested in is directly engineering the Hamiltonian of interest and studying its properties experimentally. In the kind of classical version of this, 
Um, a classical example of this is the idea of kind of studying an aerofoil in a wind tunnel. And just as it's easier to um, study an aerofoil in a wind tunnel than it is to study the dynamics of a, you know, an actual aeroplane. Similarly, um, in analog Hamiltonian simulation, it's typically easier to study the, um, the artificially engineered material than it is to study the kind of fully full uh, complex material that we're interested in. So this idea of Hamiltonian simulation is a um, concept that's been around for a long time. But a couple of years ago, two of my co-authors, along with Ashley Montanaro, kind of really initiated the full theoretical study of Hamiltonian simulation. So what they did is they put kind of the idea of Hamiltonian simulation on a rigorous theoretical footing by working out mathematical conditions of what it means, what it, exactly what it means for one um, Hamiltonian to simulate another Hamiltonian. Um, and within a kind of very, very strong definition of what it means for one Hamiltonian to simulate another, they were able to show that there are some simple families of Hamiltonians which are universal. So whereby when we say a family of Hamilton uh, Hamiltonians is universal, what we mean is that if you give me any, any kind of quantum, anybody Hamiltonian you can think of in any dimensions with any locality structure, these, there will exist a Hamiltonian within the family of the universal family of Hamiltonians, which will be able to simulate that, that Hamiltonian you gave me. So as I said, there's some very simple families of Hamiltonian which are universal. So in particular, the 2D X, Y, and Heisenberg models, where if you give yourself the freedom to tune individual interaction strengths in the Hamiltonian, those models are universal. So they're really incredibly simple models, but there is obviously the drawback there that the, the universality breaks translation invariance because you need to be able to tune individual interaction strengths. More recently, it was shown that there is a translation invariant a universal model. So it's a, um, a Hamiltonian two dimensions. Um, and here, you know, it's translation invariant. So you don't need to be able to tune individual in inter interaction strengths individually. So all previous universality results were proven using a technique used pertur called perturbation gadgets. So this is a technique from the Hamiltonian complexity literature. Um, and it's a very powerful technique. It's allowed people to prove some very nice universality results. But the drawback of perturbation gadgets is they almost, they almost hide the origin of universality. So by, con by constructing these really kind of complicated chains of perturbative simulations, you can prove very nice universality results, but you can't necessarily tell why some models are universal and some models aren't. So that's the question we're gonna be interested in here. So firstly, is it even, is it even reasonable to, um, to ask that question? You know, should we expect to be able to um, classify universal models or is that a bit of a pipe dream? Well, the kind of um, inspiration for studying these uh, universal models came from the classical case. And in the classical case, there does exist a, um, a classification of universal models where the classification is based on complexity theory. So in our work a few years ago, if you look at this first line of this table here, what it was shown was that um, if, you classify all if you classify all classical Hamiltonians by their simulation ability, what you find is that the universal um, classical interactions that are universal for simulating all other classical spin physics are precisely those um, interactions which have an MP-complete ground state energy problem. So that's in the classical case, but is there any kind of hint that a similar result might hold in the quantum case? Um, yeah, there are hints. It's not been fully shown yet, but there were hints that, that a similar um, link might hold. So in this first paper by Toby, Ashley and Stephen, where they kind of initiated the study of universal Hamiltonians, they were able to fully classify all two qubit interactions by their simulation strengths. So what they found is that the two qubit interactions, which are fully universal, so they can simulate any other class, any other quantum spin Hamiltonian, those are precisely the set of interactions that have a QMA complete ground state energy problem. They also showed that the two qubit interactions that are universal simulating all stochastic Hamiltonians, those, uh, those are the set of interactions that, are, that have a stock MA complete ground state energy problem. And as you might expect, the two qubit interactions that can simulate all classical Hamiltonians, they have an MP complete ground state energy problem. So this kind of gives a hint that there might be a similar complexity classification in the quantum case. But unfortunately, that despite these hints, there wasn't really a clear route to prove to prove the results. So, as you might expect, the kind of the proof techniques used in the classical case didn't really um, port over to the quantum case, and uh, the results to give this classification of two qubit interactions they really did rely um, rely heavily on the fact that all all your interactions were only two qubit. 
Um, but as the name of my talk suggests, uh, the answer to this question is yes, there is a link in the quantum case. But driving it requires a new method for proving universality. So rather than relying on perturbation gadgets and looking at perturbative change of simulations, instead what we do is we use another um, technique from Hamiltonian complexity, and we leverage the ability to encode computation into the ground states of local Hamiltonians. So with that in mind, we can state our, our main result. So our main result is that a family of Hamiltonians is an efficient universal model, if and only if its ground state energy problem is cure may complete under faithful reductions and the model is closed. So what do these conditions mean? I expect you're all familiar with the idea of a, um, a Hamiltonian have a ground, having a ground state energy problem, which is cure may complete. But here we've added this extra condition. It needs to be cure may complete under faithful reductions. So what does that mean? Well, it's a slightly complicated um, concept, which I can't fully kind of uh, delve into the details of it in a short talk. But essentially what faithfulness means is that we require the reduction, so the reduction from an arbitrary problem in QMA to the ground state energy problem of the Hamiltonian of interest. We require that this reduction maps the subspace picked out by the verification circuit, so the QMA verification circuit. There's a mapping from that subspace to the low energy subspace of the Hamiltonian. And so that's a little bit hand wavy, but essentially it's just saying that this reduction doesn't muck up the structure of the problem too much. So it, the, the reduction keeps some of the structure of the problem from QMA. The closure problems are a lot, uh, the closure property is a lot more simple to explain. So the closure property is just saying that if we have two Hamiltonians, H1 and H2, which are both in this model, and they're acting on possibly disjoint uh, subsets of QDITs A and B, then there exists a third Hamiltonian, also in the model that can simulate the sum of those two initial Hamiltonians. Okay, so that's the main result. How, how do we go about proving it? Well, in, in a short talk, I'm not gonna try and get into the kind of full details of the proof, but hopefully I can just give you some, some rough intuition for how the proof uh, goes. So the proof that the conditions are necessary is I would say the, the easier um, direction of the proof. First of all, closure. A closure is clearly necessary. So the definition of a universal Hamiltonian a uh, universal family of Hamiltonians is that it can simulate any Hamiltonian, any quantum Hamiltonian you give me. So clearly, if it can simulate any quantum Hamiltonian, in particular, it can simulate a Hamiltonian, which is the sum of two Hamiltonians themselves in the model. So the proof of closure being necessary is um, very straightforward. The proof that this cure may complete under faith reductions condition is necessary is a little bit more convoluted. And essentially, what we do to prove it is we construct an example. So we, we construct a family of Hamiltonians and we show that these Hamiltonians are QMA complete under faithful reductions. And we are then able to argue that um, any, any Hamiltonian which can simulate this Hamiltonian we've constructed must itself be QMA complete under faithful reductions. So essentially, if you have a Hamiltonian which meets this condition, all Hamiltonians that can simulate it also meet that condition. And since we've got an example of one, any universal Hamiltonian must itself meet this condition. Um, so the example we construct is um, a modification of the kind of very standard QMA complete Hamiltonian due to Kataev. So that's the um, proof that the conditions are necessary. What about the proof that the conditions are sufficient? So that's the kind of slightly more complicated direction of the proof. As I mentioned before, it requires a new method for proving universality. Um, and this method, this, the, what, the way this method works is we, we use the fact that you can encode computation into the ground states of QMA complete local Hamiltonians. Um, and then we use that property and the kind of computations we encode are computations which, whose outputs are properties of the Hamiltonian we're interested in. Um, and we then show that by encoding these computations and outputting the properties we're interested in, we can meet all the conditions to be a simulation. Um, I should just mention, so this, this kind of technique obviously takes inspiration from, his, from history state techniques. Um, you know, the idea of encoding computation into ground states is, um, you know, very closely related to history states. But the results are completely general. So if you construct some, um, construct some family of Hamiltonians and show that it's QMA complete, even if your proof of QMA completeness doesn't rely on history state techniques, our, um, our complexity our complexity classification of simulation still applies. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the proof, um, but hopefully it gives you some idea of, of how the proof goes. 
I did also just want to take a few moments to mention some of the other key results in the paper. So the first result is a recipe for modifying history state Hamiltonians so that the canonical reduction is faithful. So obviously the idea of a QMA complete Hamiltonian is something that's been around for a long time and everyone understood, understands very well. And you might ask, you know, is the extra requirement that this reduction is faithful, is that something reasonable or is it a very strong requirement that kind of, you know, it's so specialized that there's very few Hamiltonians you can think of that meet that condition. What we show in the paper is that that's not the case. So this recipe we provide can be applied to any, all the history state constructions we know of, and it will um, immediately lift them to be not just QMA complete, but QMA complete under faith reductions. And what that means is that for all the kind of um, QMA complete um, families of the Hamiltonian in the literature that we're aware of, all that you need to show to show universality is to show closure. The other thing we, we uh, show in the paper is we give complexity theoretic classifications of universal models which aren't efficient, but are still interesting. So I didn't talk much about efficiency, um, or I might not have mentioned it yet. Um, but within this classification of universal Hamiltonians, we you can have universal Hamiltonians which are universal, but are not efficient, or you can have universal models which are also efficient. Where when we're talking about efficiency, what we're talking about is the overhead involved in the simulation. So this can be overhead both in terms of the norm of the simulator Hamiltonian and in the number of extra spins you have to have in your simulator system in order to carry out this um, simulation. So the main result was the result about efficient universal models, but there are some models which are non-efficient but still interesting. And in the paper, we also give classifications of those. Um, and these classifications then cover all known universal models. We also provide a construction of two new universal models. So the, these, um, these, these new, new universal models, in order to demonstrate universality, we, we couldn't use the perturbation gadget technique. Instead, we use the, um, the new method to prove universality with the, that we use for the general construction. We we're also able to use this to, to provide some specific examples of new universal models. And these were both translation invariant systems in one dimension. One of these models was particularly interesting. So one of these models was a translation invariant universal model, which is efficient in terms of the system size overhead. So I mentioned that there are some universal models which aren't efficient, but are still interesting. And the most obvious example of those kind of uh, models are translation invariant models. Um, before, before this work, all translation invariant models which were known to be universal were not efficient in terms of either the overhead in terms of the number of spins or the overhead in terms of the um, norm of the Hamiltonian. And this universal model which we've come up with is not efficient in terms of the um, norm of the Hamiltonian, but it is, in, it is efficient in terms of system size overhead. And what we show is that this has implications for both complexity theory and holography. Um, I should also mention that we don't expect to be able to construct a universal model which is efficient in terms of system size overhead and also efficient in terms of, um, of the number of spins, also, also efficient in terms of the normal Hamiltonian. Um, for complexity theoretic reasons, but that's, uh, we, don't, we don't think that's likely to happen. Okay, and I'm just going to finish up with some conclusions. So as I've said, we've, de we've developed a new method to prove universality of quantum Hamiltonians, and we've used it to derive a rigorous connection between complexity and universality. We've used this new method to demonstrate universality of two new models, including the first translation variant model, which is sufficient in terms of system size overhead. There are still some open questions. I think the most interesting one is, can we use these techniques to develop physically realizable universal simulators? So previous results which relied on perturbation gadgets weren't physically realizable because they rely on very, very precise um, genie of interaction strengths. The models I've spoken about today, the, the new models we found aren't physically real realizable at the moment because they have very, very high local Hubble space dimension. So there's an open question, can we, um, can we use these new techniques to get models which don't have the perturbation gadget issue but are on a, a more realistic, uh, Hilbert, local Hilbert uh, space dimension. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Tamara. Okay, so next talk is on-site, uh, and it's by Angela Capel, and it's about uh, the modified log sobol of inequality for quantum spin systems.
Okay, so thanks for the introduction, and of course, thanks to the organizers for, for allowing me to speak here. Today, I'm going to talk about some joint project between uh, with Canvis, Rousse, and Daniel Steele Franza, who is also here. And this project is about uh, some kind of functional inequalities, which are called modified logarithmic sovelet inequalities. And for those of you who are not, sorry, this isn't working. Okay, no. For those of you who are not very familiar with these kind of inequalities, let me just give some context and some setting where they appear. So, uh, some motivation for, for the study of this problem comes from the study of the velocity of convergence of certain quantum dissipative evolutions to their thermal equilibrium. And in particular, we are interested in studying this kind of systems because, you know, we know that no experiment can be executed completely at zero temperature or completely shielded uh, away from noise. So, uh, because of having this kind of setting, we need to consider open quantum many-body systems, which are more realistic. And when we consider a system and an environment, and we assume that they are weakly coupled, uh, the resulting dynamics that we obtain is dissipative, and the continuous time evolution of an initial state on a system, uh, on, sorry, on this system, is given by a quantum Markov semigroup by some procedure that is called uh, the Markovian approximation. Probably speaking, uh, a quantum Markov semigroup is a, a semigroup of quantum channels that is continuous and just indexed in the parameter of the time. And, sorry, what we have in this case is the fact that if we consider an initial state on the system that we are calling lambda, and we let it evolve with time, when time tends to infinity, uh, if we assume certain conditions, which I'm not going to discuss here, we know that we are going to have a convergence to the thermal equilibrium. And the thing we are interested in right now is how fast this convergence is going to happen. So uh, we say in particular that this convergence is fast enough, so it's, uh, that the system has rapid mixing, when an initial state becomes almost indistinguishable with, uh, from the thermal equilibrium after a certain time t. And this almost indistinguishability is given by the rate that I write there. So essentially we say that when after a time t, the, the evolved state uh, has already fallen into a ball center in the thermal equilibrium and of radius scaling with polynomially with the system size and decreasing exponentially with time, this is what we call the rapid mixing. And we're interested on these inequalities that I was mentioning before, or on the modified logarithmic sovelet inequalities, because the optimal constant for such inequalities in particular provides an example of rapid mixing. And this is something we're going to see uh, right now. So uh, we define uh, a modified logarithmic Sobolev uh, constant as the infimum of the quotient between the two terms that I write here. The term in the denominator is essentially the derivative of the relative entropy. And you see the term in the denominator is twice the relative entropy just. And when we have positivity of this kind of constants for a family of uh, Limblatians defined on lattices that are tending to CD, uh, then we can integrate the inequality that we would obtain by considering an inequality, uh, you know, with the, with the constant that I'm writing there. And this provides essentially an exponential decay with time of the relative entropy. So when, when we put this together with Pinsker's inequality, and we consider the worst case scenario for the relative entropy. We see that we obtain this boundary right there for the one norm of the difference between the uh, state rho uh, and the thermal equilibrium sigma. And for thermal states, since we are assuming that sigma is a thermal state, uh, we know that the minimal eigenvalue scales exponentially with the system size. So what we know is that the last term that appears there scales polynomially with the system size. And this is why having an example of modified logarithmic sovelet inequality provides an example of rapid mixing. In particular, if we compare this to the optimal constant associated to another kind of uh, functional inequality, which is the Poincaré inequality, and the optimal constant is, is the spectral gap, this provides something that is exponentially worse. And this is why we're interested in studying modified logarithmic sovelet inequalities instead of Poincaré inequalities, for example. Okay, so this is a problem we've been working on for a while. And of course, uh, there's not a general way to provide examples given a quantum system uh, to, to see if this quantum system satisfies a positive uh, modified logarithmic sovelet inequality or not. So what we did in the past year was to uh, develop some kind of a strategy 
so that we can check if certain steps are met by a certain system, and then if these steps are met, then this automatically yields a positive modified logarithmic sobolev inequality. And these steps are the five that I write here, so for me it's kind of a puzzle that we, can, that we have to construct in each case. So the two pieces that are uh, on the outer part and on the inner part are some right definitions for some notions, so in particular for some decay of correlations and for something that it's called the conditional MLSI constant, which is something that we'll go to right now. And the other three pieces, the one that appear in light blue, they are three things that we have to prove in each case. So the first one of them is a certain result of quasi-factorization of the relative entropy, and this is a key part of the strategy. And then we have two more steps, some geometric recursive argument to reduce a global log sobolev inequality to a conditional log sobolev inequality in a smaller region. And finally, we have to prove that the conditional log sobolev constant in the smaller region is positive, so this is the last step. And to illustrate how these techniques would work, what I'm going to do here is to show some particular case in which they are more simple than in the, in the paper that we're presenting here. So first of all, what we have to do is to define this conditional MLSI. And for that, if you remember the notion of MLSI constant that I was presenting before, we are defining it exa exactly in the same way. But now, in the numerator, we have only the terms of the generator of the semigroup, so of this Limbladian that are defined on absolute region A of the whole lattice lambda. And on the denominator, we have something that is called a conditional relative entropy in A. And this is something that we need to define accordingly depending on, on each case. Also, I was saying before that the key part of the strategy is a result of quasi-factorization of the relative entropy. And by this, I mean essentially an inequality of the form that I write there. So it's just, uh, if we consider a tripartite system ABC, then uh, a result of quasi-factorization of the relative entropy is an upper bound for the relative entropy between two states in the whole system in terms of two conditional relative entropies in overlapping systems. So now we consider AB in one part and BC in another part, and some multiplicative term that measures how far the, the second state, in this case sigma, is from being a tensor product between the complements of the two systems considered, so in this case A and C. And the example that I was saying before is a particular case uh, that we studied some years ago in which we consider uh, the following assumption. So we assumed that our Gibbs state is a tensor product everywhere. When we have this, it's very easy to see how this strategy works because on the first step, I have there the, the pictures, you see? On the first step, we have a result of quasi-factorization of the relative entropy, which in this case is quite strong because uh, the state is already a tensor product, so we don't have a multiplicative error term there. Then, because of the definition of the conditional log sobolev constant, we go to the second line, and then, uh, well, we just have to take infimum of the conditional log sobolev constants. This is what we, did, what we, did, we do in the third step, sorry. And then, in this case, the geometric recursive argument is quite simple, so it's not nothing involved, but it's on the fourth line. And on the last line, we just put there uh, the fact that the conditional log sobolev constant is positive, which is something that was uh, relatively easy to prove in this case. Okay, so this is what we did in this case, and in the paper that I'm presenting here, uh, what we consider is a system that is much more involved and has much more meaning physically, and what we prove here is that if we consider a local commuting Hamiltonian that is at a high enough temperature and satisfies one of the following three conditions, so either it's classical it's in 1D or it's in any dimension and has two local interactions, then for each of these cases, there is a local quantum Markov semigroup with fixed point, the Gibbs state of such Hamiltonian, such that it has a positive MLSI constant that is independent of the system size. So this is what we proved here. And as I said before, this is equivalent to having some exponential decay of the relative entropy. And it's a, a cool result because in particular, in this case, it, con it constitutes the, the first unconditional proof of MLSI for, for quantum spin systems that uh, are a high enough temperature and have some, some physical meaning. Um, since I don't have much time left, the only thing that I want to do to sketch the proof of this result is to see the difference with respect to the, the result that I was mentioning before for sigma being a tensor product everywhere. And for that, we need to provide some kind of result of quasi-factorization. 
and we are building on a previous result that we had in which we proved that we could obtain an inequality of the same form that it was presenting before, but now having a multiplicative and an additive uh, error term. And the problem is that we needed to get rid of the additive term. This additive term uh, depended strongly on some pinching onto some subregion A union B. So what we were doing here is consider conditional expectations that are given by considering just the, the evolution of the Limbladian on certain subregions. And um, by taking this pinching associated to the, to the conditional expectation onto A union B, we couldn't get rid of this uh, additive term in principle. But what we did here was to consider some particular tiling of the lattice. And once you have this particular tiling, which is of the form that I'm drawing there, so with these squares, and we also have some nearest neighbor Schmidt semigroups, which are some, some particular kind of semigroups introduced by Brady and Bialy in 2005, then uh, by assuming these two things, we could remove the additive term. And once we remove the additive term and we use this chain rule for the relative entropy, which allows us to partition the relative entropy between the two states in terms of two relative entropies with the conditional expectations, then the first one of them can be bounded using some result on some positive different kind of functional inequality, which is also uh, has recently appeared. And the second part is the part for which we can provide a quasi-factorization result. So for that part, we provide a quasi-factorization result of this form. And now what we have to do is to estimate the multiplicative error term that appears there. And in this case, we are already assuming that our Hamiltonian is classical when the Ornier's neighbor. And the high temperature assumption comes from the part of estimating the multiplicative constant. So to estimate the multiplicative constant, what we do is to use a, a high enough temperature. There's some property on decay of correlations that it's called analyticity after measurement and was introduced by, by Haro et al. in 2020. And we proved that this uh, property holds a high enough temperature and this property also implies our clustering of correlations. So in particular, we know that we have a result of quasi-factorization, sorry, of the one of the form that I was writing before, where now the multiplicative term behaves properly. And now, to conclude the proof, the only things that we need to, to say is uh, what happens with the other pieces that I was mentioning before, like with the geometric recursive argument and with the positivity of the conditional MLSI. And these two things are done uh, separately. For the geometric recursive argument, we just have some uh, adaptive method from the classical literature, so from some papers that appeared already in 2002. And again, for the positivity of the conditional MLSI, we need to use uh, some new uh, functional inequality that we have to introduce, we call pinched MLSI, since it's an MLSI that it's evaluated on the pinching that we were uh, considering onto the tiling that I was introducing before. And this together with the positivity of the complete MLSI, which is this result due to Cambi Suse and Liga out from 2021. So with this, uh, I just want to mention that the applications of this, res this result are numerous because there are many recent projects in several directions in quantum information and quantum many body that involve a modified logarithmic overlap inequalities. And many authors have proven that certain uh, properties in all these fields uh, are obtained from the positivity of an MLSI constant. So as soon as we can prove that we have examples of MLSI constants, all these results completely fall from that. And with this, I just want to summarize what I said. So, uh, well, in this talk, we were talking about how we can use results of quasi-factorization of the relative entropy and decay of correlations to prove modified logarithmic overlap inequalities. And in particular, we briefly hinted on uh, the proof the first unconditional proof of MLSI for quantum lattice spin systems, which in particular uh, holds in this case for classical nearest neighbor and 1D commuting Hamiltonians. And there are many open problems that arise from here, like the existence uh, of a similar result for K-local commuting Hamiltonians instead of just two local. And also the possibility to extend this to, to different semigroups to the ones considered here. So this is essentially what I wanted to mention, and well, I'll take your questions after this. So thanks.
Thank you, Angela. Okay, so last but, but not least, we have our last speaker of this intensive session, which is Ludovico, which is online, I think. Ludovico, are you there? No, Ludovico has sent a video. He's not there in person, even online. Oh, okay. So, okay, so there is no one giving this talk then, or? Uh, I think he, uh, the, the uh, Congress host told me that he has sent a video, so they are going to play the video. Okay, so there is a, a recorded video then that will be shown? Okay, good. Okay, so, yeah. good. Thank you very much. Okay, so the talk will be uh, about universal gaps for XOR games from estimates on tensor norm, norm ratios. Okay, so whenever you want. to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So this work is done in collaboration with Guillermo Frank. Hello everyone, thanks a lot for tuning in and thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So this work is done in collaboration with Guillermo Frank, Carlos Palazuelos, Stanislav Sharek, and Andreas Vinta, who's also there at least virtually. So feel free to ask him if you have any questions. Okay, so motivation comes straight from quantum information, where we often uh, you know, use um, properties of quantum systems like entanglement to achieve, you know, to perform some tasks that involve some um, non-local you know, information processing in a better way than would be possible under uh, classical um, theory. Okay, so and for how much we love quantum mechanics, it makes sense to ask ourselves uh, whether there's non-local features of information processing are actually so how much do you depend on the fact that the underlying physics is, is quantum or are they independent or of the underlying physics? Right, so of course this requires us to define what we mean by, by uh, physical theory, but the answer we will arrive at is that the, the fact that exo games are more efficiently won with classical, uh, so with global strategies than with local strategies. This is something that is independent of the underlying physics in a precise quantitative sense. Okay, so a hands-on introduction to quantum mechanics and to general probabilistic theories is that, okay, quantum mechanics, you know, we have a real vector space of sometimes semi-permission matrices and you have your cone of positive semi-definite matrices there. And then to, to identify your state space or so your set of density operators or so positive semi-definite operators with trace one, you just slice the, uh, this, this cone of anomalized states with, um, you know, the trace one slice. So general probabilistic theory is just takes this uh, framework one step further. You just take any finite dimensional real vector space and any convex cone. It's okay, it's, it's, it's an actually reasonable, reasonable cone. Uh, and then you take any slice of it. And what you get, this is your state space. It's will be just a generic convex compact set, it turns out. And the dimension of the GPT is just the dimension of the underlying vector space. Okay, so of course, like to do information processing, we need not only states, but also measurements. So what is a measurement? Quantum mechanics, right? it's just a collection of operators, EI, that adapt, that are positive semi-definite and adapt to the identity. And the bone rule tells you that if you have a state row and you want to compute the probability of getting the outcome I when measuring it, you just have to compute the trace of row against EI. Okay, and this is really what all that matters for the physical interpretation of the theory. So what is a measurement in the general probabilistic theory? Well, pretty much the same. It's a finite collection of, um, of um, dual functionals, right? Functionals and that, are, that take on non-negative values on the cone and adapt to the order unit. Okay, so basically what we can also say is that they belong to the dual cone. What cone is a set of functionals that, that are non-negative on the cone. Okay, so in the generalized bond rule tells you that to compute the a probability of getting the outcome i when measuring the state omega, you just have to evaluate that functional on that state. And this is all, all you need. Okay, so now we are going to make a brief detour <coughs> and um, understand what injective and projective norms are. Okay, so suppose you have two finite dimensional real norm spaces and you want to introduce a norm on the tensor product. So how do you do it? So there are at least two natural ways. One is you take your tensor z and you evaluate it uh, basically evaluate uh, any product functional on it. 
and the product of unit functionals on it. And then you take the supremum over all unit functionals, so all functionals with unit in a dual norm. And the other way, which turns out is dual to that, is, so this is called the injective norm. And the other dual way, called the projective norm, is just to take any arbitrary decomposition of your tensor as a sum of elementary tensors, and then you take the sum of the products of the norms. And so these two constructions are dual to each other, but it also turns out that the projective is always um, larger than the injective or no smaller than the injective. Okay, so, but of course we are in finite dimension because also the tensor product space is the finite dimensional space. So we know that also an inequality of the opposite type will, will hold. That, mean, that means there will be a constant of domination, an optimal constant of domination, rho x, y, such that the opposite inequality works as well. Okay, so this, and this can be computed very well by taking the supremum of the ratio of projective versus injective. And of course, this whole theory was put forth by, by Grothendieck a uh, long time ago. Okay, right. So now what is an exo game? So an exo game is, is like this. So there are two agents, Alice and Bob, that are far apart and not allowed to communicate. And now I ask them questions. So a question would be a state of a bipartite GPT. I give so a bipartite state. So I give one share to Alice, the other share to Bob. Now they can do anything they want on their state, but they have to output one bit each. And I, I am the referee and I check that the XOR of them, so the parity, is equal to a prescribed answer. They know, but um, no, of course, Alice and Bob know um, what the set of answers is. But of course, since they get just one, one um, share of the state, they won't know the question. Okay, so they don't know, the, know just one half of the question. That's the, the problem for them. Okay, so now this is a formal definition. You have a bipartite the GPT, a collection of states, probabilities, average probabilities, and the correct answers. So they all know this, but they don't know which specific uh, question they have been asked. They just know one half of it. So how do we compute the optimal uh, average probability of Alice and Bob answering incorrectly? So it turns out, um, since it's um, by, by its nature kind of, um, it makes sense to compute the bias, what's called the bias, the probability of winning minus probability of losing. Right? Because okay, a random guess basically makes them win with probability of half. So uh, this is really kind of a more a meaningful um, field of merit. Okay, so and how do you compute it? Well, it depends on the local strategies that Alice and Bob have. So I will spare you the details, but trust me, it's a super simple calculation to show that um, you get an expression like this. So here you get the tensor, and then um, you have kind of a product of effects uh, or of linear combinations of effects evaluated in it. Okay, so like this. So to maximize the bias, I, we need to optimize over local measurements. So what, what I do is I declare basically the set of, um, you know, like of, of dual vectors of this form, E0 minus E1, where they both uh, they together form a measurement. I declare this to be uh, the unit pole of a norm. So in this way, I have introduced a norm on the on my uh, dual vector space. And so what um, now I have to optimize and what I get is for the local bias, so the bias when Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate, right? So it's a scenario that we have um, looked at um, till now, I get the injective norm of a specific tensor. Okay, it's fantastic. Very good news. And okay, so we know that in the local setting, no communication allowed, you get the injective norm. Fantastic. So what do you get in the global setting? Global setting is when Alice and Bob are, are allowed to meet and do any uh, joint measurement on their questions, on, on, the, on, on, the, on the global question, right? So, okay, so this turns out that the composition of GPTs is not a um, kind of a straightforward um, a topic, it's a straightforward uh, matter, but it turns out that um, in the optimal case, so when, when things go very well for Alice and Bob, the optimal bias that they can get is given by the projective norm, okay? which is, of course, larger than injective, which makes sense. OK. So you have that the local bias is the injective, and the global bias is the projective. Right? So what is the maximum advantage of global versus local strategies? Well, you optimize over, over all games. Well, this, this just amounts to optimizing over, over this tensor. And so this is what you get. This tensor can be, it turns out, completely arbitrary. So this is what you get. So this is our good old friend, the constant of domination of the projective versus the injective, oh, sorry, of the injective versus the projective, this role function that we have defined before. Okay, so and the goal of Alice and Bob is to minimize this advantage because they want to be able to, 
to solve the game also locally in a decent way as compared to globally. So what they want to do is they want to, um, for fixed local dimensions, they want to minimize this advantage. Okay, so it's kind of the, the, kind of the operational uh, setting we imagine. So what they get is this universal function just depends on n and n because the, everything else has disappeared basically. And um, just from the fine formula like this, you take the, the infimum over all GPTs of dimension n and n, and um, you take this functional law of the a and b. Okay, very good. So um, there are all sorts of questions that we can ask. So first of all, well, it's clear that this is always um, no smaller than one, of course, but, it, but, but is it always larger, strictly larger than one? This is not a priori clear. And also the scaling uh, with respect to n and m is not clear. And okay, as a bonus question, we can ask for ourselves also what happens if Alice and Bob are forced to play with the same log of GPT. Okay, so like here we, oh, sorry, we, here we were uh, taking the infimum over all GPTs, but what happens instead if we take, just for, forget about this and take the infimum over all um, local climax spaces, okay, instead? Of fixed dimension. This, of course, is more general because not all Banach spaces come from GPTs in, the, in that way that we have described before. And also, you can, you can define also the symmetrized version of this of this function. So you, basically, here you get a modified function that's called R and M, and here you get uh, its symmetrized version if you want. So okay, these functions they are just universal functions of two natural numbers, and they encode some information about the universal behavior of tensor products of non-spaces. Okay, and so it turns out that by throwing away the GPTs and taking instead the, the Banach space um, uh, function, we, we don't lose too much, right? So it turns out there's this general inequality that tells you that basically, so the scaling um, and all other interesting features of this RBN are effectively captured by this R function. And this is significantly simpler to study, so we will study that one instead. And so these are our main results. Okay, so basically we, we are able to prove that this R and also so the RBN is always larger than one, strictly larger than one. We actually conjecture that this um, it is at least um, square root two always. And we are also able to prove an asymptotic scaling that goes as the as the minimal power. So basically the minimum of n and n to, uh, to a certain power, one or eight, up to log factors. And okay, let, I also have to note that the old result by PZA already showed that this function um, grows to infinity. And we, of course, we conjecture that the optimal scaling is the square root of the minimal dimension. And okay, in the in the simpler case of the symmetric um, symmetric function, right, symmetrized function, we are able to prove such a scaling up to log factors. Okay, I will I will not uh, get into the proof of, of any of the statements because they're very um, technical in a way. But okay, so we are able to answer all basic questions about about this. Okay, so I want to just briefly remark about the connection with the geometry of the Banach Masur compactor. So basically, um, you take a, the game is like this. So you take a fixed space, um, say Rn, Euclidean space, and you consider all possible norms over, over that space. So basically, all possible um, centrally symmetric convex bodies. And you want to define a distance between that. So a distance between Banach spaces themselves. And it works like this. So you take any two um, symmetrically. Um, Centrally symmetric convex bodies, you, you apply any vertical linear maps um, on any of them, and then you try and fit one inside the other. And then you ask yourself, by how much do I have to dilate um, the, the smaller one so that it includes the larger one? Okay, so the smallest number will be what is called the Banach Masur distance. Turns out in dimension two, the optimal value is three over two, and it's exactly what I have drawn here for some mysterious reason. Okay, so there is a more formal definition of this, which is like this. You take the infimum over all possible uh, invertible operators between x and y, and then the inverse y to x, and you take the product of the norms and take the infimum. Okay, so this defines the distance between Banach spaces, and it turns out that the set of um, Banach spaces forms a compact metric space in this way. Okay. Of course, Banach spaces are identified when they are isometric. And the diameter of this turns out is of order n. Awesome. And of course, we can also aim for a bit more advanced factorization. So we can modify this and take um, basically different um, 
isometric, uh, different uh, linear maps between x and y and y and x, it's just a constraint that uh, they are allowed to be arbitrary random variables. The constraint is just that the composition has to be the identity on x. This will define the weak factorization constants between x and y, and the weak banach, banach masur distance is just uh, the, mean, uh, the maximum between weak factorization x to y or y to x. Okay, right, this is a notion that has been proposed some time ago. And uh, rule that's proof that actually the weak band of the Banach Masur compactum is much smaller than, than its um, uh, standard diameter, which is over the n. This is uh, another power of n, a smaller power of n. And the rule of conjecture is that the diameter is actually square root n. And why do we care about this? Because it's very simple to prove that uh, our um, row constant is uh, lower bounded by n divided by the weak uh, Banach Masur distance between x and y star. And so proof is super simple, I will spare that, uh, spare that to you. But so if once you take the infimum and you try and obtain this R function, the infimum will be basically the very linked to the, the weak diameter of the Banach Maslow compactor. And so Rudelson conjecture immediately implies that um, our scaling square with them. Okay, so this is, a, this is a very straightforward connection with Rudelson's conjecture. This is the, the my main message. Okay, so the summary is that we have learned that we can uh, understand XO games in a kind of, um, in, a, in a way that is independent of the underlying physics. And we can prove that the advantage, uh, advantage of global versus local strategies is something that is, uh, does not depend on the other underlying physics. And this has led us to define all sorts of um, kind of universal functions related to the tensor product of Banach spaces and um, somehow explore its connections with the Banach Masua compute. With that, I thank you very much. Okay, so let me just thank again all the speakers of the session for the fantastic session we had. And that's it. I remind you that, I mean, tomorrow morning, Tom Abidik is giving a plenary talk. And then the next uh, quantum information session are on Thursday and Friday afternoon, in case you are interested in joining them. Okay, so have a good evening and see you tomorrow.